Yo Atlas speaking and welcome to part 6 of what if I was reincarnated in the Naruto world as the legendary Kanoha outsider. Let the tale begin. Chapter 101, Naruto Uzumaki What? Takuma stared at Iroko with a countenance he wasn't sure he was showing. The words which had come out of his team leader's mouth were one of the last words he expected to hear, the last words he ever wanted to hear. I am going to the Uchiha, asked Takuma. To the Leaf Military Police Force, but yes, to the Uchiha, Iroko smiled. Like any shinobi in the Hidden Leaf, he had heard about the Leaf Military Police Force being open to outsiders for the first time since its inauguration. Normally, the prospect of being moved out of the Jinin Corp would be exciting news, but the Uchiha was one of the two places he didn't want to go, the second one being the route. Which was why he hadn't applied for it. Are you going to the police force? asked Takuma. Iroka shook his head. You're kicking me out of your team. What, because of the mission? Takuma felt betrayed. The mandatory service for a Jinin in the Jinin Corp was 30 months, only after that were they able to transfer out if an opportunity presented itself. From the very first day in the Jinin Corp, one of Takuma's goals had been to get himself out of the Jinin Corp by the end of the 30 months. It could have been through the Chunin exam or transfer into another department, Takuma was open to almost anything. Getting recruited by Iroka had eased the burden on his shoulders. Becoming a regular in the Chunin's team was a stable opportunity to continuously pile C-rank missions on his record while churning mission points in the ring to add Jutsu to his arsenal. In fact, before the Land of Frost mission, he planned to approach a few more Chunin he had met through Iroka. He could have even asked Nenro to introduce him to his Chunin connections. He hadn't chosen a department to target, but his current progress rate would have been ample for the Chunin exam. In his opinion, Things were progressing steadily. I'm not kicking you out of the team, Takuma, Iroka sighed. The team is disbanded. I've taken an alternate job which doesn't allow me to maintain an active field team. Job? What job? A teacher at the academy. The heat and panic in Takuma's head momentarily cooled as he stared at his team lead. Iroka working as a teacher for the academy was something he knew very well. Did you want to become a teacher? asked Takuma. Iroka leaned in his chair as the tension left his body. He looked away into the distance as he said, My parents died during the Nine Tails attack. I was suddenly an orphan, much like yourself. I was alone after that. My academy teacher back then, Sino Hisashi, became a parental figure at a time I desperately needed one, Iroka smiled. I knew from the moment I graduated that I wanted to become an academy teacher. I don't think I can be a parental figure, a cool older brother that I can manage. Takuma could barely muster a half chuckle. I didn't think it'd be this soon, Iroka sighed. I wanted to stay on the field for a couple more years before I applied. But a position recently opened up, and because of the mission's failure, it seems the right time to step away from the field. There's an unfavorable opinion around me right now, and getting meaningful missions will be difficult. Takuma could see the unwillingness in Iroka's eyes. He could see that Iroka wanted to be an academy teacher, but he wanted to do that on his own terms, not to be forced by the circumstances. Takuma understood that feeling. Nine Tails Jinchuriki is going to be in the academy. How do you feel about that? Takuma asked, his attention focused on Iroka's face body language, and words to not miss anything. Iroka's history made it so that the man would hold a grudge against a certain yellow-haired kid studying in the academy right about now. Iroka's hand on the table clenched, a bitter expression appeared on his face, and his body stiffened as he shifted in his seat. I know, he said. It's like a kunai sealed in a scroll, Takuma said. He's the jailer. I understand that. Iroka closed his eyes. It doesn't change the fact I lost my parents. You understand how that feels? No, I don't know how that feels. I never knew my parents, so I don't know how having parents feel. It doesn't bother me, Takuma turned his head to look away. You're lying, Iroka's expression softened. Takuma didn't reply. He never knew the boy's parents, but he knew his own parents, 
and they had been taken away from him when he found himself in this world. Takuma would give anything, everything, if he could see them one more time, to be able to hug them once and tell them that he loved them more than anything. If he could see his elder sister smile again, tell her to take care, advise her to dump her pathetic girlfriend and find someone else, and say his goodbyes, he wouldn't mind giving up anything asked in return. I knew he'd be there when I took the job, Irika sighed. I know how to conduct myself in front of a child. I won't do what you're fearing. If it helps, he's an orphan like me, just like you. He's in need of that parental figure your teacher was for you. More often than not, orphanages aren't good places for children. Irika nodded. Takuma could only take his word for it and put his hope in the source material. Later that day, Takuma walked home from the grocery store. His mind returned to his transfer to the Leaf Military Police Force. He was no longer in the Jinin Corporation. His body felt haggard, and the jute bag filled with groceries, usually weightless, seemed heavier than the heaviest dumbbells in the gym. A decision out of his control had put his life in danger. He had no idea when the Echiha clan massacre happened, but he was sure it was close in the future. And him being in the Leaf Military Police Force put him directly under the crosshair of two mass murderers who wouldn't hesitate to kill anyone put in front of them. He didn't want to be one of those people, but the recent developments had become a real possibility. Takuma couldn't even blame Irika for it, even if he wanted to. The man was only looking out for him by placing him in a situation beneficial for his career. Working for the Echiha was a huge, huge opportunity for someone like him, and working in the Leaf Military Police Force was a prestigious position with lots of additional benefits. He would have enjoyed that if he didn't know the future caveat. Sometimes knowledge was a curse, a curse he was thankful for. He could feel the assignment scroll burning a hole in his weapon's pocket. It had been a few hours since Irika had handed it to him, but he didn't have the courage to open it and look because he knew the moment he looked, it would become real. But Takuma knew he couldn't delay looking anymore. As Takuma walked through a playground, he caught a head of sun-yellow hair stepping out of the playground, and he couldn't take his eyes off the kid who slowly trudged past him. In the two years he had been in the Hidden Leaf Village, Takuma hadn't met the protagonist of the world even once, he had deliberately not made any contact, and thankfully, he hadn't accidentally bumped into him as well. Perhaps it was Fates mocking him because the first time he had ever mentioned the kid, he had appeared before him. There was no mistaking it, sun-yellow hair, whisker-like markings on cheeks, and cerulean blue eyes. Uzumaki Naruto, the Nine Tails Jailer, the child of prophecy, was in front of him. Maybe he sensed the gaze because Naruto stopped and looked back at Takuma. Naruto's brows furrowed. What? He sounded defensive. Takuma had imagined a lot about how he would feel and react when he saw Uzumaki Naruto for the first time, and despite all he had imagined, all he felt in the moment as he looked at the kid in front of him was just that. A kid, he thought. Naruto might have the Nine Tails sealed inside of him, he might have great things in his future, he might even be the savior of the shinobi world, the future Hokage of this village, but right now, all Takuma saw was a simple kid in front of him. Come here, the words left Takuma's mouth before he could even entirely process what he was doing. Naruto looked hesitant. He looked around before slowly walking towards Takuma with the hem of his shirt balled up in his tiny fists. Takuma knelt so he was below Naruto's eye line to make him feel safe. What's your name, kid? Naruto. Nice to meet you, Naruto. Where do you live? Naruto pursed his lips. Little Hope Orphanage. Oh, yeah? I used to live in the Mini Miracles Orphan Home. You did? Naruto seemed surprised. I did when I was your age, Takuma smiled. Do you like Little Hope Orphanage, Naruto? Naruto once again hesitated for a moment before shaking his head. Not too much, he said. Everyone is mean, and no fun. Do they hit you? Takuma doubted the Hokage would allow Naruto to live in a place of physical abuse. Naruto shook his head. No one smiles, and others don't play with me. I see. Do you go to school, Naruto? I do. 
I go to the Shinobi Academy, Naruto looked up at Takuma's forehead. You also went there, right? Takuma was dressed in his Shinobi uniform because before Iruka contacted him, he planned to take on a D-rank mission. He usually didn't dress in the Shinobi uniform when he wasn't working, but today he hadn't bothered to change out. Takuma touched his forehead protector and smiled, smart one, aren't you? I did go to the Shinobi Academy, the same one as you. You know, they gave me my own house when I turned 10 years old because I was attending the Shinobi Academy. Really? Naruto had the most animated reaction since the start of their interaction. He sounded so excited at the prospect of getting his own house and moving out of the orphanage. I promise, Takuma smiled. Do you like the Shinobi Academy, Naruto? I do! Naruto grinned. We play outside. Tag, hide and seek, races, catch and pass, an and an. Takuma smiled. He hadn't been a first year academy student but knew the curriculum disguised physical training as games. The goal was to lay the foundation for teaching the children to appreciate training for training's sake and partly as a teamwork building exercise. It's fun, believe it. Naruto smiled. Takuma couldn't hold back his laughter. He couldn't believe he was hearing that verbal tick in person. As studying isn't fun though, Naruto frowned. It's so boring. Takuma smiled. What about chakra? Do you like chakra, Naruto? Chirka, oh that, it's too com com comp. Complicated? Yeah, that, it's too difficult, believe it. Takuma chuckled. First of all, it's called chakra. Second, chakra doesn't have to be complicated. He took out a notepad from his person and tore an edge. His chakra held the piece against his finger as he showed it to Naruto. Do you know about the leaf concentration practice, Naruto? Naruto nodded with a frown. It's okay if you don't understand the complicated things. You can take those parts slowly, Takuma said. All you have to do is to take a piece of paper, leaves can be a bit smelly, and just try to stick them with your fingers. Sticking paper to your fingers is easier, then you move onto your arm, then to your forehead, and finally, you do it with your feet. Takuma had no idea what he was doing. His explanation seemed too complex, and well, not fun. He paused to take a breath and realize what exactly he was doing. If Mariboshi had been her, he would have done it a thousand times better. Takuma had been interacting with Naruto, Uzumaki Naruto, the son of the fourth Hokage and the Nine Tails Jinchuriki. Takuma had no idea who was keeping an eye on Naruto, and he couldn't get on those people's radar because of all the shady shit he had been up to as Scars and Tobi. Getting on a surveillance list of some kind for any reason was the last thing Takuma wanted. Because if they found what he was up to, they could get rid of suspicion that he was trying to get close to Naruto for some ulterior motive. Even without all of that, Takuma had no interest in interacting with someone like Naruto. He needed to wrap up quickly. Do you want to be a shinobi, Naruto? Takuma asked. I do. Shinobi are cool. Naruto grinned. Oh, thank you, Takuma smiled. If it were any other child, Takuma would have told them to be anything other than a shinobi. But Naruto had to be a shinobi for everyone's good. Well, if you want to be a cool shinobi, you need to pay attention to what is being taught in the academy, okay? Even if it's boring? Even if it's boring, Takuma paused. Let me tell you a little secret. Naruto leaned, looking interested. If you become good at the things taught at the academy, everyone will want to be your friend. Like they want to be friends with the jerk? asked Naruto. Takuma was momentarily confused, but he realized Naruto was asking about Sasuke. Yeah, just like that, jerk. Who's nicer between you and him? Me, believe it. Now, if you're better than him and nicer than him, wouldn't everyone want to be your friend? Then, you'll have lots of friends, smiled Takuma. Even the jerk would be your friend, wouldn't that be nice? I guess so, Naruto didn't sound convinced. Takuma reached into his grocery bag, took out a chocolate bar he had bought as a stress purchase, and placed it in Naruto's hand. Now, it's getting dark, 
and you should go back home. Take this with you and share it with your classmates tomorrow, all right? Okay. Any child would be happy to get sweets. Now go along, okay? Takuma stood up and ruffled Naruto's hair. Naruto ran away with the chocolate bar in hand, and Takuma, too, turned to walk away when he heard Naruto call out to him. What's your name, big bro? Takuma turned, thought for a moment, and said, You can call me big bro when you see me the next time, he winked, waved his hand, and turned to walk away. He turned the corner and it took his all to continue walking at a steady pace, just in case someone was watching. That was more contact than Takuma wanted with Naruto or a walking nuke like him for a very long time. Chapter 102, Shursui the Teleporter Takuma couldn't stop his foot from shaking as he sat outside the office of Uchiha Setsuna, the chunin in charge of hiring the new officers of the Leaf Military Police Force. He knew for a fact that not all the new hires had a meeting with Chunin Setsuna, he had contacted others selected into the Leaf Military Police Force only to find none of them had meetings scheduled. Takuma had zero idea why he was meeting Setsuna, which only served to jitter his nerves. Jin and Takuma, a woman, the assistant, sitting across the room behind a desk, looked up at Takuma. Chunin Setsuna would see you now. Please head in. Takuma nodded and headed to the office door but backtracked to the assistant and whispered to her. Hello, ma'am. I must say, you look absolutely gorgeous today. Do you happen to know what this meeting is about? Like, is he angry or happy, or... The woman looked up at him with a firm stare, with no words as a reply. I mean to look so stunning in the uniform requires some serious skill and charm, Takuma tried one last shot. Nothing? Takuma nodded. All right, still absolutely lovely, I'll head in now, thank you. Takuma knocked on the door and entered when he heard the word. The office was simple, clean, and looked spacious despite the moderate size of the room. A simple desk with a painting behind it, two chairs in front of the desk, a two-seater couch below the windows with a small coffee table, and one open and one closed cabinet each. Most importantly, it didn't smell of booze and smoke like that of another head of an organization that Takuma worked with. Takuma noticed a set of engraved kanai decorated on the walls, which were issued as awards of merit and bravery from the Hokage. Takuma stood at attention in silence in front of the desk while Setsuna read some documents on his desk. Sit down, Setsuna said after five minutes. Takuma knew it was five minutes because of the wall clock. A time too long to stand in silence in a person's office after being called by said person. Takuma sat down, back straight, in the chair across from Setsuna. The silence extended for another minute or two before Setsuna looked up. Tell me about the land of Frost Mission. I'm sorry, sir. I can't divulge the specifics due to the orders given to me and the ongoing investigation, Takuma's reply was immediate. After being asked the same question hundreds of times in every way imaginable, he had the answer ready on his tongue. I'm your boss, Jin and Takuma. Are you sure you don't want to answer my question? I've standing orders not to answer any questions regarding the mission to anyone outside the investigation, Takuma said calmly, but his heart slightly picked up the pace. He didn't want to be on the boss's bad side on his first day, but he also couldn't ignore orders from the investigators, and he personally also didn't want to talk about the mission. Setsuna finally looked up from his papers, and Takuma's breath was taken away as he found himself staring into red eyes with two black tomo gently spinning around the pupil. It was the first time Takuma had seen it, Achiha's Sharingan. He couldn't help but be transfixed by the hauntingly enchanting red eyes. Takuma wondered if this was how Orochimaru felt. Are you sure, Jin and Takuma? I have my orders, sir, Takuma said, staring into the eyes. Setsuna withdrew away from Takuma unhurriedly. His eyes regained their original onyx hue as Setsuna appeared at Takuma with an intrigued and inquisitive stare. I praise your obedience and ability to maintain your professional integrity, Jin and Takuma. It is an exceedingly rare quality these days, he declared. Takuma exhaled as he expanded his focus to observe Setsuna as a whole. 
The man possessed the typical Uchiha characteristics of jet black hair and onyx eyes, yet he had a noticeably square jaw compared to other Uchiha who had sharper features. He wore his hair in a short, low ponytail, adding a rougher edge to the disciplined soldier. May I ask the purpose of this meeting, sir? Takuma inquired. What do you think? Takuma didn't answer as he didn't have one. He had no idea why Setsuna had called him to the office while the other recruits gathered in an auditorium to start the mandatory 75 days of training before they could work in any official capacity. From the conversation, Takuma would have believed Setsuna wasn't pleased with him, and even though Setsuna had praised him, that could have very well been sarcasm. I'm afraid I don't know, sir. Your track record makes you suitable for the lead military police force, Setsuna retrieved a file and opened it on his table. Takuma's eye twitched. He hated it when someone read his file in front of him, it meant someone had looked into him behind his back and knew things he didn't have an awareness about. Setsuna continued, The number of C-rank missions you've done in the short time you were with your Chunin is considerable. Takuma had been the only Jinin in Team Iraka to be on every single C-rank mission procured by and issued to Iraka. He had done enough to nearly match Ninro, who had been working with Chunin longer than him. But it's the type of mission that interests me more, a sardonic smile stretched on Setsuna's face. Chunin Iraka didn't get good missions, did he? Look at all this dirty grunt work. Tailing spouses, taking night shifts at guarding warehouses, outsourced background checks, babysitting upstarts, collecting unpaid debts, repossessing assets, keeping protests in control. Next time you meet Chunin Iraka, tell him to choose better missions once in a while, but I suppose you get what you get when you follow a new Chunin with no background to lean on. Takuma schooled his expression. When applying for a new job, you never badmouth your previous employer because that only showed the interviewer that you would badmouth them in front of outsiders. Regardless, Takuma had no intention of criticizing Iraka to anyone but the man himself. Short as it may be, my time with Chunin Iraka has been integral to my growth as a shinobi. Iraka was the reason he had double-digit C-rank missions on his record. When all was said and done, he didn't care what kind of missions he had done to get that result. Setsuna knocked on his desk twice. Exactly. These missions are why you were selected and why I've called you here, he said. When you do genuine work, it shows. I've seen a hundred applications pass my desk with double, some even triple, the number of C-rank missions than yours. All of them had fluff, easy jobs, used as filler to pad up their records, he had a sneer on his lips. You have none of that, Jin and Takuma which is why you'll be put into special training with a few others who meet the criteria. Takuma was surprised, but he didn't show it, as for if he was successful, Setsuna did a great job with his straight face. He digested the information presented to him and thought about how to react. What makes this training special? asked Takuma. He couldn't reject the training, so he might as well set up his expectations. Training we give to our closest allies. That meant there was training above it that Uchiha used for themselves. Takuma wasn't complaining. He hadn't been trained by the methods employed by the shinobi clans, exposure to any level of clan training was welcome. And what after this special training? asked Takuma. Special training meant a higher investment in him, which meant they'd require returns proportional to that investment. Setsuna said, that depends on how you perform in training. Takuma mused on how he would rank above the other recruits who would be going through the regular training. Thoughts about time management passed through his head. His second contract with Ring was about to begin in a couple of days, and he needed to get back to dealing to support that. He didn't know how intense and time-consuming the special training would be, and if he would be able to juggle everything. I have to, Takuma said to himself. If he could prevent what happened in the Land of Frost, he would do everything in his power to make that possible. The iron strained the muscles on Shursui's arm as he curled the dumbbell. Shursui breathed out as he slowly brought the weight down, straining his arm again. He looked back at the door to his home gym's door, and a second later, the door opened, and Itachi stepped into the room. How did the mission go? Shursui asked, continuing to work the dumbbell. Success. That could mean various things. 
the mission went exceptionally well, and they completed the objective, or it could be that while the mission objective was met, people died. But Shursui wasn't interested in how the mission went. He didn't even know what the mission was, it was classified, only known to Itachi's team. They held the new recruit orientation yesterday. They say it went well, said Shursui. Itachi hummed, sounding disinterested. It still bothered Shursui how disinterested Itachi sounded with clan matters, he only seemed interested in his own missions and the problems the village was facing. Not that Itachi was doing anything wrong in showing interest in the village and his duty as a shinobi, but the clan was still his family, and ignoring clan matters was disrespectful. Shursui dropped the weight on the ground and got up from the bench. He grabbed the towel and faced Itachi, who was looking at himself in the full-length mirror in the corner. Clan leader addressed the recruits. I told Lord Hokage everything, Itachi said, not removing his eyes from the mirror. Shursui's mind and body went cold. He stared at Itachi in the mirror's reflection in shock from what he had heard. He knew what Itachi meant. The Uchiha clan was planning to overthrow the current regime and place themselves atop the Hidden Leaf Village as the rulers. Both of them were opposed to their clan's plans and had decided to stop it from happening for the sake of the clan, village, and nation. In deciding so, they had gone to the Hokage and told him about what the Uchiha were planning. However, they had purposefully held back most of the information and had decided and agreed on what to divulge. The Hokage was told that the Uchiha clan was dissatisfied with their treatment in the village and was gathering their allies and support to push back against the regime. They framed it so it was perceived that the Uchiha were going on an aggressive political offense that would cause great tension within the village and could create conflict, disrupting the state of the village and its operations that extended past the village boundaries and throughout the land of fire. They purposefully held back the information that the Uchiha were planning a coup d'etat that would destroy the village beyond repair. Shursui didn't want the village to suddenly brand the Uchiha as enemies and declare them as traitors, as such, he wanted the information to come out at a gentler pace so the Hokage wouldn't make any drastic decisions. The plan was to disclose parts of the information as the situation warranted eventually. But now, Itachi had told everything to the Hokage, without asking Shursui. Itachi looked at Shursui in the mirror's reflection and found Shursui's eyes red with three tomos spinning rapidly. He turned away from the mirror to face Shursui directly and opened his mouth to speak, only to freeze up. When he looked into Shursui's Sharingan, he no longer saw the three tomo design, instead, he found himself gazing into two four point pinwheels. As Shursui, green translucent flames erupted around Shursui, and before Itachi could move a muscle, an enormous skeletal arm sprang out from the fire and pinned Itachi to the wall. The mirror shattered and the wall behind Itachi cracked from floor to ceiling. The entire building shook as if an earthquake had passed by. Itachi, you know very well that I trust you with my life, Shursui said, his face set in stone, but his eyes burned with anger and perhaps a twinge of madness. So, I would like you to think very carefully and tell me why you decided to go behind my back. Understand that right now, I don't find myself very trusting towards you and that if your answer doesn't satisfy me, I'm very tempted to, and capable of, erasing the person called Uchiha Itachi and putting a puppet in your place who wouldn't endanger the clan. Do you understand, Itachi? The skeletal fingers tightened around Itachi, constricting and contorting his body. Now, answer me. That day, Itachi would narrowly escape with his life and learn about the existence of the Mangekyo Sharingan. Chapter 103 Job Opportunities Setsuna Uchiha Setsuna stopped to look back as he was about to exit the Leaf Military Police Force. Yakumi? The one to call out to him was Uchiha Yakumi, one of the squad supervisors. Can we talk about the recruit you're sending me tomorrow? Yakumi asked. Setsuna looked at his wristwatch. It was already past working hours, and he wanted to return home to his family. Talking about work after hours was his least like thing to do, but looking at Yakumi and thinking about the man's reputation, he deemed it prudent to have the conversation with him. Let's talk over tea, Setsuna sighed, if he was being made to work after hours, he would make Yakumi pay for some evening tea and sweets for his children. What do you want to know? 
Setsuna asked Yakumi sitting across from him in the busy tea shop inside the Echiha complex. Who are you sending me? asked Yakumi, setting his teacup down. You must have gotten the file. I read the file, that's why I want to know why send him to me. This Takuma kid. I don't see it. Setsuna sipped his tea. You don't like what you say? All I saw was an inconsistent record with too many irregularities for my liking. I'd much rather appreciate someone reliable than someone with high peaks sprinkled between lows. The special recruits were to be sent to Department Setsuna and the instructors had chosen for them by observing them during the training period. Their locations were based on the recruit skill and the department pecking order. Not all departments were equal, based on the crimes, media attention, and politics, departments in the LEAF military police force were considered of varying importance. Yakumi's department happened to be among the top of said pecking order, if not the very best. While most departments weren't genuinely excited by the incoming recruits because of their origins, if they were going to get recruits, they needed to be the best. Yakumi's department head insisted, demanded, that they get the best of the recruits, and Yakumi's squad was the one to receive the recruit. Setsuna couldn't say he hadn't seen this coming, Yakumi's department was strict about who they let in, no matter the recruit's background. The dossier Setsuna had sent consisted of Takuma's shinobi file without the censored information, he couldn't go around spreading confidential information to anyone when it took his jonin supervisor's clearance to get it, along with Takuma's training reports and logs. I want to know what's not in the file, asked Yakumi. Setsuna crossed his hands and thought about the question. If it had been the normal recruits, he wouldn't have an answer, for he hadn't directly supervised or trained them, but Yakumi was asking about one of their new special recruits, who he had worked closely with for the past two and a half months. The training had finally ended, and the trained recruits would be joining official duty from tomorrow. Before training, I too worried about his inconsistency, said Setsuna. He was mostly interested in Takuma's C-rank mission record. But, He's strangely competent. What do you mean? Yakumi asked, hearing the inflection. He's a slow learner, but once he gets the hang of it, things stick in his mind like glue. That's not the strange part. The strange part is how he seemingly already knows all sorts of things that our people usually learn on the job through the years. Setsuna recalled how Takuma knew precisely where to pat a person down to find hidden bundles and packages, when the recruits were taken to an arson scene, Takuma already knew how to sift through debris to look for the source of fire, he could crowd control with ease through clear instructions delivered using his chakra-enhanced voice, had an unexpected amount of knowledge of major and minor gangs and groups around the Leaf Village. When he was sat down at a desk in one of the precincts, he guided the civilians and visitors as if he was used to doing it. One thing I'm sure you'd appreciate is that he listens and follows. Setsuna had seen many recruits who thought they were hot shit when they entered duty, wanting to take charge and acting as if older shinobi didn't know crap. Takuma wasn't like them. He keeps his head down, does his work, and, he observes. There was a week where I worked every day with the recruits when I noticed that every time he'd be the last to speak, he isn't mute or sparse with his words, Takuma observes first, takes people's points, and only then presents his thoughts. Those were the traits he had seen many leaders. Whenever a topic was in discussion, they never put their thoughts out first so as to not taint others' views and lead everyone to accommodate the leader's view through their own. Instead, they went last to get everyone's perspectives and only then spoke their own. Of course, that wasn't all a leader was. And Takuma wasn't without faults. He lacked initiative, didn't display charisma to gather people, and was frankly overly cautious, as if someone was constantly out to get him, perhaps beneficial in the field, but those types of people weren't well-liked from the get-go. If you're worried about him being a slacker, you shouldn't be, said Setsuna. You and yours will like him. Yakumi didn't look convinced. Setsuna wasn't even sure why Yakumi even wanted this meeting because, from the looks of it, Watching Takuma work from his own eyes was the only way to get the doubt and skepticism out. I don't like this new system you're trying to push, Yakumi frowned. There's a reason why our people work in other departments before transferring to ours. It's a tough job. Do you think a kid like him will be able to take what comes with it? 
Setsuna had thought about it. Assigning people from outside the clan and their allies into every corner of the Leaf Military Police Force was supposed to be a message to all the clans in the village. The Uchiha were coming out of their shell, catching up to all of them who had been recruiting outsiders to boost the human talent. It was also a message to everyone else. If they wanted resources and opportunities, the Uchiha clan was now a destination. It was a declaration. The Uchiha clan was changing. And if anyone thought to underestimate them, they would come to regret it. He understood Yakumi's department was hard to enter, and it was so for a good reason, but if he wanted to make the message mean anything, he needed to create an image that the Uchiha were fair. That even outsiders could reach places that one would think were reserved for clan members, even if it was half the truth, as long as people perceived it as entirely truthful, that's all that mattered. Takuma was to be such an example. A walking, living, breathing poster of Uchiha's fairness and generosity, their willingness to work with those who showed promise. That if a shinobi named Takuma could join one of the most prestigious departments of the Leaf Military Police Force, so could they. I'm sure he'd be fine, said Setsuna, or at least that's what Setsuna hoped. He had chosen Takuma for a reason. The psych evaluation attached in the confidential report done after his land of frost during the course of multiple interrogation sessions showed him to be mostly mentally stable. What Takuma had gone through wasn't easy for a greenhorn shinobi. First blood, losing comrades, giving them field funerals, and then crossing two nations all alone, if Takuma could keep himself together after all that, then Setsuna hoped that the boy could keep himself together doing the job Yakumi's department did. It's dangerous territory you're treading, Setsuna, Yakumi warned. Setsuna nodded. I know, my friend. I know. If Takuma could not? Well, sometimes sacrifices were needed for grand causes to be successful. He and the clan could only learn from their experiences and get better, just like how their Sharingan allowed them to grow stronger from every enemy thrown their way. Setsuna looked at his blurry reflection on the tea's surface. One day, the Uchiha would take what was rightfully theirs, and that day would be soon. Takuma sat down in the corner of a large office space with a book on crime scene investigation and mapping in hand. Perhaps it was because of his experience in the academy, but Takuma found natural crowd noise to be the background noise for concentration. He read the text blocks on the pages, reading the academic text that was a slow slog to get through, but it was something that one of the teachers had recommended, and Takuma was feeling a strong sense of imposter syndrome, and learning more was the only way to keep it under control. Jin and Takuma Takuma looked up from his book to see an Uchiha standing before him. He could tell from the looks. Takuma closed his book and stood up to greet the man. Good afternoon, Chuyin Yakumi, said Takuma. You know of me? Yes, sir. I was the outside help on the Higurashi pharmaceutical case, it didn't have a name back then, but the media had given it one. A look of remembrance flashed across Yakumi's face. Chunin Iroko was the one we brought in. Yes, I remember it now. And you were part of his team back then? I heard about the Land of Frost mission. How is he doing? He has decided to take a break away from the field and has joined the Shinobi Academy as a teacher. An admirable route, Yakumi nodded, but his tone didn't hold no such sentiment. Takuma could tell that he had said it just for the sake of saying it. Yakumi continued, let's not waste any more of our day. It's time to introduce you to the team. As Yakumi led him, Takuma felt nervousness creep up with every step. The training was something of a honeymoon period. It was tough, in some ways as brutal as the training under Taskmaster Yoshio, but it was very much an instructional training course where he was okay as long as he did what was asked of him. Do this, get that, and as long as he did it correctly, he was praised slash not punished. But the actual job was different because inside of the classroom was nothing like the real world. Since he had found himself in the world, Takuma had never thought he had been handed something he didn't deserve. All of his skills he had worked to the bone to achieve them, his academy graduation gained through a year of misery, he had won the final tournament through grit and decisions that set himself for victory, his D-rank missions worked like a laborer, 
He got his ring membership because of his win at the final tournament and the gains through the ring were an outcome of blood and sweat. He had nabbed his position at Irika's team through a great impression and had retained his spot in every mission through pure results, even his drug dealing's earnings were a result of good service. But the opportunity at the Leaf Military Police Force had come out of the left field. He hadn't sought it, nor had he wished for it. Irika had thrown it in his lap as a way to take care of him. Maybe because of that, Takuma felt he didn't deserve to be a part of the very illustrious organization. He felt that he needed more time, more skills, and more merit to earn. He felt he wasn't ready for it. You'll be working under me. Takuma buried his thoughts and focused on Yakumi, who continued, So, I'll say this straight to your face. I dislike this arrangement, and you shouldn't be with us. That did wonders for Takuma's anxiety. People work hard to be in the position you've been handed on a silver platter. These are my thoughts, but everyone's. Yakumi walked one step ahead of Takuma and spoke without looking at him. You will be under constant observation, your moves will be gone through a fine-tooth comb, and your peers will try to pick your faults to undermine you, so beware, make a wrong move, and it'll be announced and paraded through the department. Takuma felt his feet turn into heavy stone. He pulled on his vest around his neck to let some air in as he kept his lips sealed shut. He felt Yakumi's every single word like a hammer through his body, mind, and spirit. He was a drug dealer and underground prizefighter about to join official duty in the police. After the Uchiha, who would soon all be killed, he was the person in the most danger due to his occupation. Being under observation was the last thing he wanted. But it was about to become his reality. They arrived in front of large double doors that were fully open, and a rock is coming from inside. Yakumi turned to Takuma and pointed at the red strap around Takuma's arm with the Leaf Military Police Force insignia sewn into it. You don't deserve that. Yakumi looked Takuma in the eye. But if you do the work, do it well, and prove without a doubt that you deserve to be here, then I'll personally help you to shut every doubter down. Jin and Takuma, Welcome to the Leaf Military Police Force. With a heart that drummed in his heart, Takuma looked above the double doors with a plaque bolted on the wall. Department of Organized Crime Chapter 104 Takuma the Dirty Cop When he was young, Takuma used to be super conscious of what other people thought of him. The feeling was so severe that he would even worry about what a passing by stranger thought of him, as such, he would try to present his best cool proper self whenever that sensation of nervousness arose. As he grew up, Takuma realized how unnecessarily over-exaggerated his thoughts were, just like he didn't care about other strangers, they too didn't care about him. With hindsight, it was so obvious. Ever since that realization, except for the little things here and there, like holding his breath until the person passed by, so no one would see him out of breath, Takuma gradually stopped caring what other people thought of him. But strangers and people he knew were two different entities. There was still a part of Takuma which was conscious about what his family, friends, and acquaintances thought about him. He could only let his hair down in front of his parents and closest friends. Though, ever since coming to the strange world, that conscious feeling had been forgotten due to the fact that he simply didn't have the time to think about what others thought of him at all times. He was too occupied, stressed, and tired for his thoughts to even look in that direction. Simply put, he didn't give a shit what others thought. However, as Takuma sat smack dab in the middle of the Department of Organized Crime's offices, he felt like a hundred eyes were staring at him. The conscious feeling he had long forgotten seemed to return in full force. Takuma no longer had any doubt about Yakumi's words about people looking out for his every move because it had only been half an hour since he had joined the department, and it was already this bad. Yakumi had to step away due to some urgent matters and had asked Takuma to set up his desk until he returned to give him a tour and brief him on his duties. In that time, not a single person had come to converse with him, not even as much as a welcome. Takuma sat there, feeling the gazes and picking up whispers. He wasn't happy with being left alone and turned into a pariah. All that did was make working difficult, if he couldn't properly cooperate with others and refer to them for help and guidance, working in most workplaces would become difficult very soon. 
and his time alone in the academy with Hyge and his group had taught him an important lesson. People tend to take advantage of those who they think wouldn't bite back. If he were alone here, they would try to screw him over difficult cases or try to push their mistakes onto him. He needed friends and collaborating peers to make his work life functional. You. Takuma turned away from the desk and looked to the side at a girl who had suddenly appeared beside him. The metallic amber eyes scowled down at him with her arms crossed with a displeased expression on her face. I never thought I'd be this happy to see you, Takuma smiled, standing up to greet her. It's been a while, Arisu. Fuma Arisu, his academy classmate, tournament opponent, and someone he considered an acquaintance with whom he had a good relationship, in spite of the girl's tendency to glare and scowl at him whenever they met. He could only attribute that to her being a sore loser. That trait of hers was in itself a charm point as it made for some great banter. What does that mean? Arisu's scowl deepened. I mean, look around, the people around here don't seem to like me, Takuma whispered. He followed it up with a smile, except for you, of course. I don't like you very much either, she said. So do you like me a little, Takuma flashed her a smile. Arisu rolled her eyes. Something came up, so the captain will be busy. He has asked me to get you started. Let's go. I'll give you a tour, she said. Captain? Captain Yakumi. Takuma's brow quirked. We're on the same team? Unfortunately. At that moment, Takuma knew he was going to stick by Arisu. She was the only person he knew here, on the same team as him and around the same age as him. Arisu fell right in the strike zone for the first person to build a relationship within the police force. Thanks. Let me treat you to dinner after this, said Takuma. Arisu eyed him for a moment before nodding. I'll take you on that offer. Takuma followed Arisu with a smile as she gave him a tour of the Leaf Military Police Force headquarters. The training was conducted in a separate facility owned by the police force, and this was the second time he had been in the headquarters. He diligently listened to whatever Arisu pointed out. She told him about the people on the hierarchy chain, people to look out for, who were the go-to people, who did not mess with, and all the office comfort things one needed to know. So, we don't work out of a precinct? Takuma asked. The police headquarters was built near the Uchiha sector and next to the village's prison. But there were precincts and police stations around the village where the squads worked out for better service. There are sites around the village not accessible by the public that we use, but organized crime doesn't have regional distribution. Your desk here in the office is the one you'll be working out of as long as the case doesn't require you to move to an external site. As Arisu showed him around, Takuma noticed how she seemed to be well-liked as she shared small greetings and friendly words with a considerable number of people throughout the headquarters. How long have you been working here? Takuma asked Arisu. This year will mark one year, said Arisu. Three months in Jinin Corp, huh, Takuma sighed to himself. And how long in organized crime, he asked. Seven months. You had five months in training? Takuma asked, surprised. The training he had was the same given to Uchiha allies like Fuma clan, as such, Arisu should have the same two and a half month training he had. I didn't have a training period. It was already decided from long ago that I'd be in the police force somewhere down the line, so I was given the basic training before I was a Jinin. I was in the Department of Shinobi Fraud before I moved to organized crime. Takuma gazed at her back. He mused if he should read into the words and between the lines. From how she phrased it, the choice was made for Arisu without asking for input. Was she in the police force against her choice, parental pressure, perhaps? He also noted that she had gotten the training beforehand, making him wonder if that was the norm for the Fuma Kaon or if Arisu was special in some way. He decided to look into that. That's why everyone dislikes you, Arisu said, glancing back at him. It took half a year to get the people to warm up to me, and at least I did five months in shinobi fraud before I got transferred to organized crime. You hopped into organized crime without doing time anywhere. It's like you didn't pay your dues, she said. Any tips? They're pissed, so don't try to worsen their impression, 
she said. The only way to make people like you is to do your job, if you make a mistake, own it and try to correct it, take responsibility and show a willingness to learn and help, eventually, they'll warm up to you. She sighed, I'll help you, try not to worry about it. They eventually ended back at the organized crime offices, where Takuma once again felt eyes on him. Do you have any other questions before I run you through the case you'll shadow me on? Arisu asked. Yeah, just one question. Do we have a narcotics department? Takuma asked, sounding as nonchalant as possible. Hmm, narcotics? No, we don't have a separate one. Organized crimes handle narcotics, Arisu said as she searched for a file and a pile on her desk. Why? Do you want to work on drug cases? I don't know, maybe, said Takuma as he stared at the workplace he would be working in. Takuma dragged his feet back to his house after a hectic first day. It wasn't the toughest day he had experienced, but the first day in a new environment drained his energy as quickly as a plug at the bottom of a tub. He deposited himself in a chair in his living room and completely slumped as he stared at the wall littered with papers. He then glanced at the four large rectangular packages, each more than half his height. He stared at the packages for a good while, his mind protesting against getting up, much less doing work. But with a mighty groan, he lugged himself off the chair and started to pull off the pages, and sticky notes stuck to the wall one by one and sort them on the small dining table. After half hour, the wall was clean, with stripes of paint missing due to the tape and adhesive used to stick the pages to the surface. Takuma walked to the packages and tore the brown covering away to reveal a corkboard. He took out his toolbox and measured the corkboard and wall twice each before hammering the nails into the wall. He then took the new four corkboards and placed them side by side to make one large cork surface on his notes wall. He walked to the other side of the living room, where a stack of stationery sat in the corner. He took out a sticky notepad and wrote down words on it as he walked to his new wall and stuck paper in the middle of the corkboard with a thumbtack. Organized Crime he had walked himself into a lion's den. Organized crime handled narcotics-related cases. In the months he had been working as a drug dealer, he hadn't been blind to what was happening around him. Inomoto's and Ryo's business was fairly organized, with everyone doing their role as cogs in a larger machine which made the entire operation run with a profitable smoothness. He always knew the risks associated with it, and his Toby persona, along with his multiple dealer identities, were there to safeguard him. He was confident with how he conducted business to know that he wouldn't be the cause of a potential downfall. However, he didn't have that confidence for factors outside of his influence. The other dealers, Ryu, Inomoto, and other competitors. They could screw up and cause him, the little guy, some serious trouble. He needed more protection. And now that he was inside the source of danger, it provided him with an opportunity to access a place that others wouldn't even dream to get their greasy paws on. Takuma didn't know how valuable his position was, but he knew that it was valuable. However, he was willing to find out. Chapter 105 Interlude Shinobi Crimes Takuma walked into the room, minding where he stepped and what he touched. The room was a bedroom, twice as large as Takuma's bedroom. It also had much more personality to it due to personal knickknacks, items, and how everything tied together to showcase the owner's personality. Speaking of the owner, she was right in the middle of the room, lying down on the bed, in the pool of her blood that had long soaked into the silky soft sky blue sheets. That's a dead lady, he muttered with a disgusted face, not because of the dead body but because of the putrid smell that had seeped into the bedroom. The body had reached the point in putrefaction where the smell started to become horrid. Way to state the obvious, Arisu remarked snarkily, but her eyes were transfixed on the dead woman. The young woman, who seemed to be in her mid-twenties, had a ball of cloth stuffed in her mouth, and just below her chin was a dagger stuck in her neck from which all the blood had dribbled down her neck, clothes, and bedding. A robbery gone south? Takuma commented. From the looks of it, said Arisu, fanning her notepad in front of her face. The wardrobes and closets in the room were all open, with clothes and items thrown out on the floor. The entire house mirrored the bedroom with things sprawled as if someone had raided the home. 
Arisa glanced at Takuma. This is your first time at a murder scene. How are you feeling? Takuma stared at the lady. It was a gruesome sight, one he would have preferred not to look at all, but at the same time, he couldn't take his eyes off the dead woman. Perhaps it was because of all the crime scene photographs he had seen during the training, but Takuma doubted that was the reason. I'm feeling fine, Takuma said. He simply observed, taking every aspect of her through his eyes. Enough chit-chat, let's get to work. Takuma and Arisu looked to the bedroom entrance as a young woman in her early twenties entered the room. She had short cropped black hair and the standard Uchiha onyx eyes hidden behind red-shaded aviators with a shiny red bead earring hanging from one ear. Uchiha Kano, another chunin in the police force, was part of organized crime. She was one of the senior officers under Yakumi, who was a captain. Down the ladder, Takuma and Arisu were junior officers. The police force had the policy that everyone had to be dressed in the standard shinobi uniform, as such most of the Uchiha shinobi came out to be low-key, and even outside of duty, he hadn't seen an Uchiha dripped out as to say, but Uchiha Kano with her pixie-cut hair, red aviators, and earring, had to be the most dripped out Uchiha Takuma had seen. Takuma, what's the investigation focal point, asked Kano as she put on her rubber gloves but didn't step near the dead body or the bed. This bedroom, answered Takuma. There was a method to investigate crime scenes. A homicide had a different investigative approach to that of a burglary, but to ensure a thorough process, a few standard steps were outlined in the Leaf Military Police Force Manual to ensure a thorough process. The first step to investigating a crime scene is to establish the scene dimensions. To do that, they had to define the investigation focal point, the area where the crime occurred or the victim was found, the main area of disturbance. Then, radiating out from that point, investigators established an area that is sizable enough to likely contain all relevant physical evidence that may be present. It was easier for investigators to condense the size of a scene at a later point than to discover that sensitive evidence outside the scene had been damaged or destroyed by other responders, media, or onlookers. In addition, Potential paths of perpetrator entry slash exit were identified. Safety was paramount during the importance during the initial approach to the scene. Weapons, biohazards, chemical hazards, and even intentional traps could await the people approaching the crime scene. In this case, the definition of investigation focal point was easy enough due to the nature of the crime. The dead woman was found in her bedroom, and from the blood present on the bed, it didn't look like she was killed somewhere else and then later transported to the bedroom. Yes, the entire house was ransacked, which increased the area substantial evidence could be found, but because a dead body was present, the bedroom was the focal point, the place they would base their strategy upon. Kano hummed. Who entered the home before us? She asked Arisu. Arisu flipped her notepad open. The landlord and five of the neighbors, she said. The landlord and one more person entered the bedroom itself. Kano clicked her tongue in displeasure. The second step in investigating a crime scene was to secure the area. According to the basics of investigations, every contact left a trace. Everyone who entered or exited the scene would add or subtract material from the crime scene, so securing the area quickly was crucial. To control access, the scene was to be cordoned off. In this case, the house was part of an apartment building located on the second floor. They had moved everyone off the second floor, and even though the possibility of finding evidence in the hallway was close to zero due to the amount of activity, they had still done it to give themselves some space. Moreover, Takuma, Arisu, and Kano needed to be removed from the list in case they left behind a trace, while the five neighbors and one landlord needed to be considered as additions to the list. One of them could be the perpetrator, and removing them from the list just because they entered the scene afterward was putting them outside the scope of the investigation, and they might even have done it purposefully to save themselves. To ensure they weren't a person of interest, the investigators would need to interrogate them and confirm their alibis, among other things, to eliminate them from the suspect list. All of which meant extra work, and thus, the reason behind Kano's displeasure. Write down their names and addresses, and ask them not to leave the village any time soon, said Kano. Already done, said Arisu. 
Kano looked at them and smirked, good, then let's chatter, shall we? The third step in investigating a crime was to create a plan. Before any evidence could be collected, the investigators first needed to develop a theory regarding the type of offense that had occurred. Knowing the kind of crime aided the investigation and helped the investigators anticipate the evidence that could be present. In some circumstances, this required gathering information from witnesses or persons of interest. Based on that information, the crime scene team would develop an evidence collection strategy taking into consideration weather conditions, time of day, and other factors. That way, when the investigators collected the evidence, they better know what to look for, and thus potentially increasing the quality of evidence that might be collected. It's a robbery, said Arisu. But then why kill her? Kano countered before asking, Who's she? Makia Hirano, Takuma flipped open his own notepad. Twenty-six years old. She had been working as a receptionist at the Green Flag restaurant for four years. The restaurant's owner called Hirano's home when she didn't show up to work on Monday and called her landlord when she didn't come in on Tuesday. The landlord went to her home this morning and found her like this. The door was unlocked. According to the landlord, she had been living here for two years by herself. And, she doesn't have any family, parents passed a few years back. Any eyewitnesses? asked Kano. Takuma shook his head. Nothing we have heard as of yet. She tried to fight back, and the perpetrator killed her in the struggle, Arisu picked up the point from the four. Takuma looked around, but from the state of the apartment, no sign of struggle was evident at first view. With all of Hirano's belongings on the floor, they would need to clean everything up before they could recognize if there were signs of struggle. Could be, said Kano. She squatted down, gently lifted the dead woman's hand, and checked under the fingernails. She pulled her aviators down her nose and Sharingan came to life. Aha, uh -huh, there's some red down here. She must have scratched the suspect while they struggled. Kano got up and pushed her aviators back up. All right, during evidence collection, let's look for evidence tied to signs of struggle when we sweep the place. She continued, the question that arises is that if there was a struggle, why didn't any of the neighbors get a whiff of what was happening in here? Arisu pointed at the balled-up cloth in the woman's mouth. She couldn't have screamed to the limit with that in her mouth, she said, but we have to consider how the killer got in because the door isn't damaged, and with a struggle, I don't see her inviting the killer in. Maybe she knew the killer, and she let her in, and that's how he got in without problems and was perhaps able to ambush her before she could make a ruckus, said Takuma before pointing at the air conditioner in the room, which was rattling like a pile of screw and bolts. That probably kept the body cold enough to slow down the decomposition and putrefaction and maybe even dulled any noise that might have made here. Kano again stepped to the dead body and began checking for things Takuma didn't understand, so he silently observed, trying to learn. The way Kano had been talking to them was for their benefit, mainly for Takuma's benefit, so they could get better. He was given the opportunity so that he would make the most of it. The body had already entered the stage of secondary flexidity, said Kano. What's that? asked Takuma. When someone dies, the body enters the stage of primary flexidity where all of the muscles in the body relax. All of the muscles in the body relax, eyelids lose their tension, the pupils dilate, the jaw might fall open, skin sags, and the body's joints and limbs are flexible. As muscles relax, sphincters release and allow urine and feces to pass, said Kano. Kano wasn't only a chunin, a senior officer, from organized crime, which put her on a higher tier than some other senior officers, but she was also an irionin, which came in pretty handy during cases involving homicides. Takuma made a face but quickly schooled his expression. Kano continued, as part of primary flexidity, the body then experiences pallor mortis, algor mortis, liver mortis, which you can learn about on your own time, it's rigor mortis which happens next, where chemical changes within the body's cells cause all of the muscles to begin stiffening. Takuma, of course, knew about rigor mortis. It was mentioned plenty of times in movies and shows for him to remember what that meant. After reaching a state of maximum rigor mortis, the muscles will begin to loosen due to continued chemical changes within the cells and internal tissue decay. 
That process is known as secondary flexidity, she said. During secondary flexidity, the skin will begin to shrink, creating the illusion that hair and nails are growing. Rigor mortis will then dissipate in the opposite direction. Once secondary flexidity is complete, all of the body's muscles will again be relaxed. Her body is already losing the stiffness, and if we take in the air conditioner into consideration, I'll say that she was killed sometime on Sunday. We will have to take the body to the coroner to know the exact time, Kano finished and got up. All right, let's start the photo shoot, and then we'll bag and tag all the stuff. Step four to crime investigation was to conduct a walkthrough of the scene. An initial survey of the scene was then conducted to prioritize evidence collection. Kano walked around the room and identified valuable evidence, and Takuma and Arisu took notes and captured initial photographs of the scene and the evidence. The crime scene was documented to record conditions such as whether lights were on or off, the position of shades and doors, the position of movable furniture, any smells present, the temperature of the scene, etc. Takuma was the designated photographer, he wasn't good enough to click award-winning shots, not even enough that people would use his photographs as their wallpaper or put on posters, but he had gotten good enough with a film camera to click some dank crime scene photos and to click them quick enough that he wasn't getting in the way. After Kano was done pointing stuff out, they moved onward to step 5, which was to document everything related to the crime scene which garnered interest. Takuma being the photographer, had to do it in a certain way. Every identified piece of evidence was to have three photographs, an overview shot, the entire crime scene, an establishing shot, to properly show the location of the object of interest with respect to everything else, and a close-up shot, to show any details of interest. Numbered tags along with a scale were present in the photographs as well. On the other hand, during the evidence collection process, it was crucial that the crime scene investigator followed proper procedures for collecting, packaging, and preserving the evidence, especially if it was of a biological nature. The body was taken early during the process and sent off to the coroner's officer, who had total authority over it and had to prepare the reports regarding the death. After they were done, the last step was to conduct a secondary survey and a review to make sure they hadn't missed anything and as a quality control step. And that was step one of the crime investigations. They still had to do so much more before they could come even close to closing the investigation, and with it, the case. Chapter 106, Drug Addicts She didn't let her attacker in. Takuma slapped crime scene photographs on Arisu's table. Whoever it was, they broke in. Arisu looked away from presumably a file from another case. She squinted her eyes as she regarded the photos that were shots of Makia Hirano's, the victim, front door lock. What am I looking at? she asked. Takuma pointed at the photo, specifically the scuff marks and scratches around the face of the lock. It's obvious from the color of the scratches on the lock that they're new. The landlord told us the door was open, so it's clear that he didn't try to break in, and he's the landlord, he would use a key if he wanted to enter, which means it was someone before the landlord. Whoever it was, they weren't good at it, as they tried to force the lock open instead of picking the pins inside. You can tell that from, scratches? Arisu asked, skeptical. What if she was drunk and made those scratches with her keys when she was trying to enter her house? Takuma went silent for a moment. He looked at the photographs, and from the angles he had taken, he couldn't tell if there were damage to the lock. He clicked his tongue, he needed to get better at taking images. That is a possibility, but I'll go back and take a look just to be sure, Takuma sighed. He had to go check it because identifying the entry of the killer was crucial for the investigation. They could focus their attention on certain suspects if they knew how the killer entered the house. Takuma heard someone call out his and Arisu's name. They gazed across the room to see Kano exit her office while a file to them as she walked towards the interrogation rooms. Ah, they must have bought in the lover. Arisu packed the stuff on her desk as she got up. What, who did they bring in? asked Takuma, confused. Hirano's boyfriend, said Arisu. The next door neighbor told us that she heard Hirano and her boyfriend often fight when he visited. We called him in for an interrogation. Come on, let's see how he performs. 
Takuma didn't know about the interrogation. It turned out that unlike shown in police procedural shows, law enforcement worked on multiple cases at a time. Takuma was involved in three more cases other than the Hirano murder case. I've got to make sure I'm caught up with what's happening, Takuma told himself. He had to ensure that he was kept in the loop on every case he was on, or else he would be left behind on every one of them. There was only a limit to what he could rely on others, and it was his responsibility to keep himself up to date on everything. Takuma looked through the two-way mirror at the small interrogation room with one table with two chairs across each other and one extra near the corner. The table was big enough to take up most of the room, and the space left around it was only sufficient for one person to barely walk around comfortably, giving the room a cramped feel. That was by design, of course. There were a few different types of interrogation rooms designated to and modified by organized crime, and this one was to make the person being interrogated as uncomfortable as possible so they couldn't relax. And right now, inside the interrogation room, Kano sat with Hirano's boyfriend while Rizu and Takuma watched them from the viewing area on the other side of the mirror. From the looks of it, Hirano's boyfriend looked like a usual chap, if not a little blue. But that'd be expected, his girlfriend had been murdered, and from the looks of it, their last conversation had been a fight. A part of Takuma's mind felt sympathy for the guy, but the other part regarded the boyfriend as the potential killer. It was a type of mental conflict new to Takuma. He couldn't say he was a fan of it. Where were you last Sunday? Kano's voice came through the speakers in the viewing area. A at my home, answered the boyfriend. Do you have someone who can vouch for that? No, I was alone. Kano hummed as she stared at the boyfriend, who squirmed under her gaze. The time of Hirano's death had been determined to be on Sunday, somewhere in the evening. The first step for eliminating from the suspect list anyone was to see where they were throughout the day. The more clarity and detail they could provide about their location and actions on that day, the safer they would be as long as they were away from Hirano's home. I aspire to be like her, said Arisu. She had admiration in her eyes as she gazed at Kano and the interrogation. Takuma looked at Kano, who was his supervising officer, with Yakumi as his commanding officer. He didn't know much about Kano, but he did look up to her as much as one would do if they worked with someone who held considerable experience and knowledge over them about a job or craft. Kano was part of a Jonin team out of the academy. After she was promoted to Chunin and her team disbanded, she applied for the police force. Because of her medical background, the higher-ups wanted her to continue working as a field shinobi as an Irionin, and if she wanted work in the police force, she was given a position in the coroner's office because they suited her skills, said Arisu. Given her skills, it made sense, but Kano wanted to work in the police force as a crime investigator, so she fought for the position and started out in shinobi fraud and worked her way to organize crime, all the while facing a resistance from the higher-ups in the Echiha clan and police force. Takuma looked at Arisu and recalled how she also had done a stint in shinobi fraud before moving to organize crime. He mused if Arisu was copying Kano due to her admiration. She persevered, and here she is, one of the best investigators and interrogators in the police force, Arisu sounded proud. I heard she got offers from ANBU but rejected them because she wanted to work in the police force. Is she really that good? Takuma looked at the interrogation happening in front of him. Unfortunately, he didn't have enough experience with interrogations to differentiate between bad, good, and great interrogations. Of course, she is. Arisa gave him a stink eye before the look of admiration returned to her eyes. Ask anyone in the police force, and they all will say the same thing, you can't lie in front of Uchi Akano. Takuma looked at his supervising officer, and she didn't seem to be doing anything special other than asking questions, writing down the answers, digging through follow-ups, and repeating the process. Her line and direction of questions were sound and solid, but wasn't that what one would expect from someone experienced? Do you know why she wears those shades? asked Arisu. Takuma shook his head. Kana wore her red aviator shades as much as she did not. She wore them both outdoors and indoors, be it during the day or late in the evening, there was no time or place where Kano thought that her shades weren't welcome. Because they hide her sharingdon, Arisu said. 
Takuma's eyes widened as the realization dawned on him. Daily, he was surrounded by people who could use Sharingdon, but because he could look everyone in the eye, he wasn't worried as long as their eyes stayed onyx. But what about Kano? The first time he had seen her, it was with her shades. And he had quickly made it her default look. He could even say that seeing her without her shades was out of place, like it was weird to see someone who wore spectacles without them. Sharingan doesn't allow the Uchiha to tell lies from truth, Arisu continued, but it can do so much more, and Kano has figured out a way to use her Sharingan to tell when someone is lying. I once asked how she did it. Kano said that it was cold reading turned up to eleven. Of course, I think she was underplaying it. I've seen it on display, it's like she can read their minds, target and prod their thoughts until they're willingly spilling out their guilt and truth in front of her. It was known in the shinobi circles that the Fuma clan was the Uchiha clan's closest ally. That fact was evident by how many Fuma clan members were in the police force. In the entire village, the Fuma clan might be the one who knew the most about the Sharingan next to the Uchiha clan because of how closely the clans worked with each other. There's no one in the entire Uchiha clan who can use the Sharingan like her, Arisu declared proudly. And Takuma would have been impressed if his head wasn't occupied by the thoughts of his interactions with Kano. Had she used her Sharingan on him? Had he unknowingly divulged some of his secrets? Arisu smirked, I'm willing to bet she read you on your first meeting. That did wonders for Takuma's anxiety. As in, it made him plunge deeper into it. Maybe Takuma had let his worries show on her face because Arisu slapped him on his back. Don't worry about it. If she didn't like you, she would have already called you out, and Kano would definitely not still be working with you, she said. Inside the interrogation room, Kano stood up, exited the room, and walked into the viewing area. She had her red shades in her hands and rubbed her eyes as if fatigued. He doesn't seem to be lying. They fought often, but I don't think he did it. The crime of passion doesn't match what we usually see in crimes of passion. He has some alibi, which should clear him out. However, we can't strike him out just yet. Kano turned to Takuma. Check the alibi out and go ask Hirano's friends if they ever heard or noticed signs of violence on her. What happened to you? She noticed how tense Takuma was. Takuma shook his head, straightened up, and schooled his expression. Yes, ma'am, he said, taking the notepad from Kano. Kano glanced at Arisu, who only shrugged. Takuma followed his orders and checked the boyfriend's alibi, which cleared him of suspicion. But before returning to the office, Takuma took a detour to Hirano's house to check his lock theory. The house had been released from police custody, and the landlord had already started the clean-up on the house while Hirano's family had taken out their late daughter's belongings. However, according to the landlord, they hadn't changed the locks, which allowed Takuma to photograph the lock and the door for signs of damage. Knew it, said Takuma as he squatted before the door lock. The door's wood was lightly splintered, combining that with the scuff marks, it was clear that someone had tried to brute force the lock open without a shred of delicacy. It was a miracle that the lock was still functioning and the damage wasn't clearly visible until closely observed. He quickly took the photographs so that he could show them to Kano. But as Takuma was clicking the photographs, a thought passed his mind. Brute forcing the lock would have made noise enough to alert the person inside that someone was trying to break in. If Hirano was aware of the fact, why didn't she scream? Not screaming wouldn't make sense. Even if he assumed she was asleep and was a heavy sleeper, the sound should have been enough to wake someone up. What if she did scream? Takuma looked at the door beside Hirano's house. Hirano had two neighbors, one on each side. One of them was a couple who were on vacation at their parents' house and hadn't been home when the murder happened. The other one was a single woman who lived alone like Hirano. In fact, she was the one who gave them the information about Hirano's boyfriend and their fights. She could hear them fighting, Takuma thought, which meant if something went down in Hirano's house, there were great chances she would have been able to hear it. And if Takuma recalled correctly, the woman was home during the estimated window of Hirano's death. Takuma stood up and walked to the next door and pressed the doorbell. He put his ear against the door and listened in. 
he heard the noise of falling, a groan, and then what sounded like someone getting up and walking towards the door with irregular but rushed steps. Takuma stepped back from the door. As it slowly opened, Takuma caught the sight of the engaged latch and then a woman peeking through the gap. W. What is it? said the woman. Good afternoon, ma'am. I'm from the police force, and I was wondering if I could ask you some more questions about your neighbor, Hirano, asked Takuma as he looked down at the woman. I've already answered all the questions you all asked before. I'm aware, ma'am. I just have some more questions I quickly need to get out of the way. It won't take more than a few minutes, he said. Takuma gazed at the woman. She was lightly shaking as if feeling cold even though the weather was warm and the sun was at its peak. From the gap visible to him, he could see her clammy and sweaty, pale skin, unkempt hair, dark bags under her unfocused eyes, and a god-awful smell as if the woman hadn't bathed in days. Takuma, by no means, was an expert, but he had been a dealer long enough that he had seen most of the stuff that came with the territory. He had been to places, seen people, and knew what the bottom of society looked like when they let go of everything for just one thing, and one thing only that gave them joy. So, he felt confident when he could tell that the woman wasn't suffering from a ridiculously high fever. And instead, she was going through severe withdrawals. Chapter 107 Drug Ninja World Takuma sat at his desk, his foot tapping an impatient rhythm on the floor as he stared at Kana's office. After hyping himself about it for a bit, he went and knocked on the open office door. Kano hummed without looking out from the documents. It's about the Hirano case, said Takuma. Kano heaved a deep sigh of subdued frustration. Takuma understood where that was coming from. The Hirano murder case should have been the responsibility of the Department of Homicide. It wasn't like the Department of Organized Crime didn't see murders, on the contrary, 50% of all deaths were directly caused by or related to organized crime. But there were no signs that the Hirano murder case was related to organized crime. The only reason the case had been forwarded to organized crime was that homicide was swamped with other cases. The Hidden Leaf Village was the hub of Shinobi, and Shinobi on Shinobi crimes were unsurprisingly high for various reasons. I believe I have a solid lead to solving the case, said Takuma. Kano looked up. What is it? Takuma placed the photograph of Hirano's damaged door and lock on the table. After checking after the boyfriend, I went back to the house to get some more photos. As you can see, someone tried to force it open, which leads me to believe that Hirano didn't let her kill her and willingly. We found blood and scratched skin under Hirano's nail, meaning she didn't sleep through it all, leading me to believe there was an audible struggle. Even if we somehow assume that Hirano didn't make a peep, just forcing the door should have made enough noise. And while I was there, I recalled how Hirano's neighbor was the one to give us the boyfriend tip, and ma'am, the walls are thin. I put my ear to the door and could faintly hear footsteps, a struggle would have been clearer, and he had taken his enhanced hearing into account. Kano leaned into her chair. Takuma had her attention. I'm assuming this has something to do with the neighbor, she asked. Takuma nodded. She's a junkie, ma'am. I questioned her, and the signs of withdrawal were clear as day. It seems she hasn't had a fix of whatever she's hooked to. He gave her a description of what he saw. And? Are you saying she killed Hirano for money? Kano didn't sound satisfied. Takuma shook his head. He hesitated before speaking out his thoughts, ma'am. I believe it was one of the enforcers. Kano's eyes sharpened at the words. She reached for her aviators on her desk and fiddled with the shades for a moment. And how would you know about the enforcers, Officer Takuma, she asked. I live right next to the eastern slums, ma'am, said Takuma. Every third person in my neighborhood is hooked onto something, and most of them can barely afford their hobbies. He looked Kano in the eye. Enforcers are akin to regular guests in where I live. I'm well aware of what they are. It was true. Takuma's residence wasn't in a great place. People lived miserable lives, and drugs were their way to cope with it. But due to the nature of drugs, people tend to indulge beyond their means, and that's where enforcers came in. When people weren't able to pay up, 
enforcers were sent to collect debts. Enforcers were symbols of fear, lingering in the corner of people's minds, reminding them of the consequences, and most of the time, that worked. Fear was a great deterrent. People paid up by any means possible. However, there were times when fear didn't work and people slipped up. That's when enforcers did their job, after all, fear needed to be built. They threatened, confiscated property, and in some cases, they even killed. Takuma's knowledge about enforcers didn't end there. Inomoto and Ryu had their enforcers as well. Inomoto used his enforcers to threaten retailers like Ryu if they weren't able to pay up for their purchase, while Ryu used his enforcers against dealers like Takuma and lent them to the dealers to deal with problematic customers for dealers. Because Takuma didn't reveal his true identity, Ryu refused to sell to him on credit. Takuma didn't need enforcers because of how he had developed his clientele, his business practices that revolved around customer satisfaction, and because his bottom line was to pay up Sango's bills and not turn maximum profit, he didn't have many problems cutting people off if they refused to do business up front. And if someday he needed an enforcer, Takuma preferred to deal with his customers on his own. It may be a reach, but I think there's a chance that an enforcer might have mistaken the target, said Takuma. However, I think we might be able to confirm if we bring in the neighbor for questioning. I'm sure she must have seen something. Takuma didn't push the questioning to be safe because he didn't have solid proof to put behind his conjecture. Kano stayed silent, leaving Takuma standing without an answer, and with every second, Takuma thought if he had indeed overreached. All right, bring her in, I'll interrogate her. Kano sighed, it's not like we have any other leads to follow. Murder cases went two ways. They were either easily solved, or cases died due to the lack of eyewitness to identify the murderer or a lack of clear proof tying someone to the murder. As long as the police had an eyewitness, motive, and some evidence, suspects usually broke down during interrogation and confessed to the crimes. But if there was a lack of leads, it became harder with each passing day to nail down the guilty party. Every cold case was a detriment to the department. Yes, ma'am. Takuma clenched his fist, confidence filling him. You really went ahead with that lock thing, didn't you? Arisa glanced at Takuma as they stood in the viewing area of the interrogation room. Takuma watched Kano and Hirano's neighbor in the interrogation room. The woman looked as bad as before, if not worse. It was clear that she hadn't been getting her fix and that she was too deep beforehand for the withdrawal period to pass quickly on its own without help. With her condition, bringing her wasn't difficult. Takuma threatened her a little bit with some drug-related criminal charges, and she had no choice but to comply. She's in a bad condition, Arisu frowned. Perhaps she's the one who killed Hirano for the money and belongings. She wouldn't be like this if she were the culprit, Takuma said. Let's say the money and valuables stolen from Hirano's house were used to pay off the debt or a part of it, the dealers wouldn't let the woman go and supply her with some more drugs, and with how the woman was suffering, she would take the drugs, and the cycle would continue. Whatever it is, I'm sure if Kano is as good as you said, we will have the truth soon. Of course, she will. Arisu harumphed. Takuma already had the name of the enforcer. For obvious reasons, he couldn't reveal it due to the source of it. Takuma as Toby had kept his identity hidden, but that didn't mean he was invisible. Dealers had some level of interaction and awareness of each other, and Takuma was no different. He knew the other dealers, even those who sold different drugs than him. Territory, corners, and customers were an essential part of the drug space, and some etiquette needed to be followed to maintain peace among wholesalers, retailers, and dealers. No one wanted conflict to arise, especially not the people on the bottom rung, most of them who were barely earning a living. Especially not when conflict would attract the police force's attention to them. Unlike many drug organizations that had law enforcement in their pocket, the ones in Hidden Leaf Village operated without any assistance. The Leaf military police force was the biggest enemy. Takuma had prod around, and the answer had come about. Of course, no one could be sure, and even Takuma didn't have any proof, but the probability of him being right was high. It was as Arisu said. 
Kano didn't take much time to get the truth. You were right, said Kano as she entered the viewing area. She was there when the attack happened, she even got a glance of the killer and said she can identify him. Kano looked at Takuma. It seems you were right. It was most probably an enforcer, which we can confirm after we get an identification, and he indeed mistook the target, she sighed, to think it'd be so idiotic as mistaking the target. As it turned out, Hirano's neighbor was in serious debt due to drugs and couldn't pay. When she couldn't get drugs from one dealer, she approached another, offered her body to extend a line of credit and surprisingly did it multiple times, a strawberry, as they called them in the business, the debt continued to pile up. It seemed the people got fed up with her and decided to get rid of her due to her actions. A hit was probably issued. Takuma could see where things had gone wrong. He didn't know where any of his clients lived. He knew their general area of residency, but their exact addresses were unknown to him. He never visited their home as transactions happened elsewhere, so he didn't care. Takuma believed that somewhere along the line, the home address had been miscommunicated. Moreover, there were no nameplates in front of the houses, only house numbers. The killer had gone into the wrong house, not asked any questions as it was a hit, and done the deed without listening to a word Hirano might have said. As soon as we identify him, bring him in, Kano said. Yes, ma'am. The target is Nakai Goru, said Arisu, holding a photograph in front of the three people. One of them was Takuma, and the other two were beat officers who were inducted alongside Takuma but weren't given the same training as him. He's a former Jinin, left the system three years ago, and since then has been known to be part of the Haru group, working as an enforcer for them. Jinin were signed to a whopping ten-year contract after they graduated from the academy. Only after that ten years could they leave the shinobi system to pursue other occupations. Every Jinin was subjected to that contract, and if they were trained after the academy in some technical field, as in Iriajitsu and Fuinjutsu, that contract was extended. When a shinobi was promoted to Chunin, that contract was extended even further, and the same for Jonin. Every year, Jinin left the shinobi system throughout the nation. Some went to be employed by private organizations or whoever could pay them, and the market existed as these ex-shinobi were cheaper, but they were also less skillful. Others switched their occupation altogether and did something unrelated to the shinobi world. There were also people who ended up joining illegal organizations who wanted shinobi in their ranks to boost their strength and standing. Especially in the Leaf Village, every criminal organization worth its salt had ex-shinobi, or even current shinobi, in their ranks so they could survive. Nakai Goru was one of those ex-shinobi and was employed by the Haru group and was involved in many illegal activities. Drug peddling being one of those activities. He comes to the casino every Wednesday, Risu pointed at the building in the distance. He's in there right now, and according to the intel, he will be out in some time. When he gets out, we will bag him. Officer Takuma and I will take charge. She turned to the beat officers. While you two will provide backup. I don't believe there will be much of a problem with our numbers, but let's be careful nevertheless. After the briefing was done, Arisu turned to Takuma, who was checking his gear. Nervous? she asked. Hmm? Not really, Takuma shrugged. Well... I'm worried about civilians getting involved. Arisu narrowed her eyes. She thought he would be nervous about a potential combat situation, but from the looks of it, he looked pretty relaxed. She wondered if he was experienced, and then recalled the rumors about the Land of Frost mission, which had been working its way around the department. She didn't know the details, but from what she had heard, there was a clash. Perhaps that's what gave Takuma his confidence. Hey! Arisu trailed off when she noticed Nakai Goru exiting the casino. Get ready, let's finish this quickly, she said. Takuma nodded, his eyes following Goru like a hunter stalking his prey. Chapter 108 Drug Syndicate Nakai Goru Goru had an average height but had a build so wiry that it looked like he hadn't eaten in weeks. Upon hearing his name called, he looked back at Arisu standing a few feet away from him. 
His eyes went to the Leaf Military Police Force's red armband around Arisu, his face turned displeased. Standing behind Arisu was one of the beat officers, giving Goru a stink eye. Arisu caught Goru's reaction and was prepared if he ran away, but she didn't make any hasty movements. How may I help, officer? Goru's tone didn't hide his disregard. We'd like you to come with us for a talk, said Arisu. Goru's eyes narrowed. May I ask what this chat is about, he asked. No, you may not, replied Arisu. Then let's do it some other day, officer, I'm busy today, Goru turned to walk away. I'm afraid you don't have a choice, said Arisu as the sound of metal clinked from the heavy handcuffs with thick bracers in her hands. You're under arrest. Gora paused and turned his neck to eye the handcuffs in Arisu's hands. He then continued walking without sparing another look at the two officers. And before Arisu could say anything, Goru unclenched his fist for a ping-pong ball-sized smoke bomb to drop on the ground, and before anyone could react, a wall of smoke rushed out, blocking out the part of the street. A wave of panic immediately hit the area and the screams of civilians as they ran away from the smoke. Arisu took out her walkie-talkie from her person. We got a rabbit, she yelled. She ran through the smoke and barely spotted Goru jumping over the wall. She kicked the pavement and shot forward toward Goru, who immediately swerved into the narrow alleyways away from the main street. Arisu clicked her tongue and followed him in. This part of town was crowded with old planning codes and poor construction, making buildings crowded, with lots of narrow alleyways and tight streets. Every corner was a chance for Goru to disappear and get away. It was a chase where Arisu had to be done on his tail, as a moment of delay could potentially allow Goru to escape. Goru took a sharp turn to the right, Arisu followed, retrieved shuriken from her bed, and the moment she turned right, a volley of shuriken cut through the air for Goru, but before the shuriken could bite into Goru, he slid down on the ground. The shuriken flew over him and dug into the stone wall. Goru used his momentum to stand up and ran into another corner without missing a beat. Arisu gritted her teeth and pushed harder, but the moment she turned the corner, there was a poof of smoke, and two Gorus split up and dashed into opposite corners. Arisu faltered. In the rush, she missed the chance to check the shadows on the clone. Which one is he? Arisu's mind turned furiously. At that moment, the walkie-talkie on her belt crackled to life. You're right. Over. Arisu didn't spare a glance to the left and charged into the right corner, and Takuma was correct as she could see Goru's shadow. Goru looked back with a smug smirk on his face which drained and turned into a frown the moment he saw Arisu on his tail. He clicked his tongue, jumped into the air, and started climbing the wall. He's coming towards you! Arisu yelled into the walkie-talkie. I see him! Over! Gora climbed to the short rooftop and looked around in a hurry to chart a path to follow and escape. He turned his head only for a kunai to enter his sight. He immediately moved his body away, and if it were only that, it would have been fine, but then Gora noticed a burning tag fluttering on the kunai's tail. Shit! Goru immediately jumped away, but he was a beat late, and the force from the explosion hit his back and threw him against the raised ledge of the roof. He groaned but immediately got up and saw Takuma standing two roofs away. However, he couldn't take a proper breath as another kunai line towards him, this one line with an explosive tag as well. Crazy fuck. Gora jumped down from the roof and landed behind Arisu and the officer with her. Fuck you. Gora kicked the officer into Arisu before running away with staggered steps. Gah. Arisu almost fell but steadied herself at the last moment. You all right? She asked the beat officer. Why, yeah. That was all the confirmation Arisu needed before she started chasing Goru. He's heading towards the Haru district, Takuma said through the walkie-talkie. Arisu clicked her tongue. Goru was from the Haru group, and the Haru district was an informal area in the village that was occupied, controlled, by the Haru group. Arisu understood what Takuma meant. If Goru entered the Haru district, they wouldn't be able to get him. Someone somewhere in the area would hide him and cover for him. 
even if they tried to look for him, as long as Gora stayed in the Haru district without doing anything stupid, it would be incredibly difficult for them to catch him. Try to cut him off, said Takuma. On it! Arisu sprinted faster than she ever had. Knowing that Goru was heading towards the Haru district, Arisu knew she had to force him into one of the main streets. It was clear that he knew the area better than all of them combined, and if they let him weave through alleyways and side streets, it'd be inevitable they'd lose him, but if she was to force him to the main street, controlling Goru would be easier. She took out half her cache of kunai and readied herself to force Goru out. As they approached a corner, Arisu expertly placed a kunai to Goru's left and immediately followed it with another to make sure he didn't go in that direction. It had the intended effect, and Goru shot to the right. Arisu kept doing that, throwing direct strikes and tries to actually get Goru and to ensure he didn't know what she was trying to do. It didn't take a lot for Arisu to lead Goru to the main street, and as Arisu skidded out of the narrow alleyway, she grabbed a storage scroll in her weapon's pouch that contained her Fuma Shuriken. She hadn't been able to use it in the narrow space, but now in the big street, she could unleash it, and by God, she wanted to do it. Goru had pissed her off, and she wanted to take some of the frustration. Ah! Oh. But Arisu hadn't considered that the main street wasn't much better than the narrow alleyways. Instead, the new space problem was because of civilians crowding the place. She clicked her tongue. The Fuma Shuriken was a weapon that caused brute destruction, a weapon that was a hammer rather than a scalpel. If she threw it here, she would mow down civilians along with Goru. She growled at Goru, but then her eyes went further to the red wooden archway that acted as the entrance to a market and to the so-called Haru district. A crowd of people moved in and out of the market. There was no time to contemplate. The crowd presents another problem. Even if she gave Gora chase into the Haru district, which she could because nothing was stopping her, the crowd would add another level of difficulty as Goro could hide in the crowd, use them as obstacles, or worse, take hostages in desperation. Goru. Before the rest of the sentence could exit her mouth, a blue blur shot out of a side street and thrashed into the Goru. An exchange of momentum took place. Goru turned into a blur, and Takuma became visible. He had shouldered Goru, who went flying into a building beside the road. The impact cracked the wall, and just when Goru's feet touched the ground as he slid down, Takuma was already beside him. He grabbed Gora's face from the front and slammed the back of his head into the wall repeatedly before bending him down to place a devastating knee strike into his liver. Takuma let go of Goru, who fell down at Takuma's feet. As one would expect, there was a large commotion due to the sudden outbreak. People who lived in the Hidden Leaf Village had become desensitized to shinobi and the occasional violence that came with living in a village full of mercenaries. One would expect people to get as far as possible to avoid the fighting, but instead, they began gathering around Takuma and Goru, trying to get a look at what was happening. Arisu made her way through the viewing crowd to reach the front, where Takuma had already switched from chase and apprehend mode to crowd control mode. He kept people away from Goru, who was completely knocked out on the ground without a hint of consciousness. You really are vicious, aren't you? Arisu said. He had bitten off her ear while fighting during the tournament, and the way he handled Goru was a bit too heavy-handed. My experience tells me that an overwhelming force is often the best way to defuse situations and end fights, Takuma said as he tied Goru up and put his unconscious body over the shoulder. Let's get going. I'm tired because of all the running around. Chapter 109 Fight Club Troubles Takuma watched through the two-way mirror as Kano battered Goru into a purple and blue pulp. The man had bruises so ugly that even his mother couldn't love the swollen and bloody face. Kano had been going at the man for a few hours already, and Goru had already fainted countless times under the interrogation, woken up, and then thrashed again, but the man refused to speak up. The Hirano murder case proceeded swiftly after Goru's arrest. They had blood from under Hirano's fingernails, and after matching it to blood samples procured from the man himself, it was clear beyond any doubt that Goru was the killer. They had the neighbor as an eyewitness placing Goru on the scene, his blood on the victim, and a charge sheet in the police force records telling a history of involvement in the drug trade, 
they didn't need anything more to put Goru away for a good few years. Capital punishment existed in the hidden leaf village and land of fire, but the value of life was much different in a world strife with war fought with superhuman mercenaries. Goru killing one person didn't warrant putting him to death. No, Goru had something else planned for his future. If he were lucky, he would spend time in imprisonment, but that was unlikely. Goru was once a shinobi and possessed a body strengthened by chakra. Letting an able body be idle in captivity was a waste. Instead, Goru would be sentenced to a few years as an unpaid slave down in the mines, digging for coal or whatever mineral that needed to be mined out. Takuma didn't envy Goru one bit. He had heard stories about how criminals were treated down in the mines. None of those stories had the word pleasant associated with them. Kano left Goru alone in the room and walked into the viewing area. She removed her blood-stained leather gloves and slumped down in the vacant chair. He isn't opening his mouth, Kano clicked her tongue. They had already got Goru for the murder, but they wanted more from him. Kano wasn't beating the life out of Goru for the fun of it. They wanted Goru to name someone in the Haru group and implicate them for ordering the hit. But Goru had kept his lips zipped. I would have taken the deal we offered him before, Arisu commented. They had offered Goru a lowered sentence, less time in the mine, but he had rejected it and kept his mouth shut, which had led them to use force. They knew the Haru group higher-ups behind Goru, but they needed Goru's willing word to create a tie to them so they could progress the matter. He's scared, Takuma stared at Goru. He knows we won't kill him, but that can't be said about the people from the Haru group. If he opens his mouth, even going to the mines for a few years won't be safe. The problem was that Takuma didn't know how to exploit the fear. He didn't know how to either overshadow Goru's fear of the Haru group or relieve that fear on a condition. We'll try again tomorrow, Kano sighed as she stretched her arms and legs, and if he still refuses, we move on. Technically, they were already done with the case with Goru, getting their hands on someone in the Haru group was them trying to make something extra of the situation. All right, it's getting late, get out, both of you, said Kano. She turned to Takuma. Just one last thing. I don't care how you apprehend a suspect resisting arrest as long as you don't damage public property. A portion of the repair costs go out of our budget, and we already don't have much of that. So, let's try not to drain our wallets. Yes, ma'am. Takuma understood and did a mock salute. He wholeheartedly understood where Kano was coming from. The Hidden Leaf Village was always in a state of damage and repair due to the presence of Shinobi. Things broke due to careless use of chakra and strength, which made the government spend a significant chunk of the budget towards the maintenance of the village to keep it livable. Takuma sighed. Of course, in the real world, disparities existed. In impoverished areas such as where Takuma lived, funds often didn't make it through, and when they did, they were insufficient and needed to be stretched, which led to the usage of poor construction materials. The roads around his house had new potholes whenever it rained. He could kick down light poles, crack walls, dig holes in the ground, and it would be months before anyone would move their ass to fix stuff. Takuma shook his head and took his leave. He changed into casual clothes in the locker room before heading into the town. Being a shinobi often turned distance into displacement. It was like marking a spot on the mini-map and heading toward it in a straight line. Takuma avoided routes by jumping roof to roof, avoiding stepping on roads, and occasionally watching the people below him. Watching people go about their lives as he leaped over them was one of his favorite sights. He soon reached his destination and threw a black ski mask over his face before entering an old diner from the back entrance. The diner was manned by a mother and her son in his early twenties. The back of the diner could be seen through the kitchen but not by the dining area. Both of them saw Takuma enter, but neither gave him a second glance and went back to work. Both of them were civilians and ran a legitimate diner, but they also hosted one of the entrances to the ring exclusive to staff members and fighters. He didn't know what deal they had made with the ring, and he didn't care. Takuma entered a back room with a huge well-sized hole in the middle. He stepped over the shallow wall and jumped inside. 
The depth was around 20 feet, and it opened up to a rough tunnel with yellow bulbs lining the ceiling that opened to the familiar corridors of the ring. He went straight to his single-person locker room that had his gear. There was a knock on the door, and Scars exited the room to meet the ring employee. Ready? Takuma nodded and slowly walked to the arena entrance. Being rough and heavy-handed with Goru wasn't just to finish things swiftly, it was also to ensure that Takuma himself didn't get injured. As it stood, Takuma's most important asset was his body, if he got injured, it was an annoying hassle until he got fixed. He moved around a lot these days. Furthermore, he already had an occupation that risked his well-being, he didn't want to add another one. Scars! Takuma ran out of the tunnel and entered the cage to the crowd's cheers. He turned a full circle to look at all the people around the arena, it had grown double in size since his first contract days. It no longer came as a surprise to him. His fight spots had improved, making the audience improve naturally, plus, he had a nine-fight win streak, attracting the gambling audience to him. Takuma stretched his back and rolled his shoulder as he turned to face his opponent, only surprised to see a young teenager standing across from him. 99% of the people he fought were young adults and adults, and there were sometimes people on the cusp of adulthood, but he hadn't had someone as young as the guy in front of him. From the looks of it, his opponent couldn't have been older than 16 years old. The question was, why would they pit someone as young against him? This was the 19th fight on his second contract, and he had won 14 of them, a stellar record. And if you include his 42 previous wins, he was still cruising on a 60% win percentage. And going against him is the Fall Hornet with a record of 13 to 15. Not even 36 fights, Takuma frowned. Takuma put the thoughts aside as the announcer exited the arena and turned his attention to his opponent, Fall Hornet. The fight was in the Taijutsu category, which somewhat explained why someone like Fall Hornet had been matched against him due to Fall Hornet still being an inexperienced fighter, but it still didn't why against him. The moment the doors fell down, Takuma shot toward Fall Hornet, who assumed a stance instead of creating distance between them. If Takuma was Fall Hornet, he would have made a distance between them, given the gap in their record, but seeing that Fall Hornet assumed a stance, he was either confident or inexperienced. For a moment, Takuma wondered if there was something strange with Fall Hornet and that the guy might be one of the prodigies, perhaps even someone who was in a Jonin team. But he put that aside almost immediately. He was on the attack, and hesitating while on offense was the last thing one should do. He planted his foot on the ground as he pivoted and lashed out a spinning hook into Fall Hornet's side, who went for an arm block. Fall Hornet's legs couldn't keep him on the ground, and he went flying to the side. Takuma stepped on the pedal and chased after Fall Hornet as he tumbled and rolled on the ground while trying to regain his balance. Fall Hornet regained control and slid back on one knee and one foot. But when he looked up, Takuma came down at him with a punch that knocked him down despite having a block up. Takuma didn't miss beat mounted Fall Hornet on the waist and rained down strikes on his face while Fall Hornet tried to raise his joined arms to block, which didn't go well as Takuma got in most of his punches. Crack! Fall Hornet's mask cracked, another crack appeared, and another, until the bottom left quarter broke away, exposing the black ski mask beneath it. Perhaps it was panic from part of the mask coming off that Fall Hornet's arm shot up and grabbed Takuma's hands. The fight slowed down as Fall Hornet gripped Takuma's wrists as the latter tried to push his fists forward. Takuma stared into Fall Hornet's brown eyes, one of which had almost closed up due to the swelling caused by Takuma's beat down. Takuma felt Fall Hornet's arms shake, he put a bit more force, and the arms buckled as Fall Hornet groaned under pressure. You should be careful with your hands, Takuma said, his voice modulated with chakra. The next moment, Takuma opened his fist and grabbed Fall Hornet's wrists as he jerked the grip off his wrists. You'll be in dire trouble if you lose one of your main weapons. Takuma gripped Fall Hornet's wrists tightly and twisted them the wrong way. Fall Hornet's one eye widened. He began to shake and push underneath Takuma while trying to free his hands in desperation. Takuma felt the bones move underneath his grip before he felt the snaps. Fall Hornet screamed as he felt his wrists break. 
Takuma let one of Fall Hornet's wrists go and launched a brutal elbow strike down on Fall Hornet's face that knocked the lights out of him. Scars! Victory, the announcer screamed. Takuma stood up and frowned down at his opponent. The fight was easy, which was good for him, it meant more money, mission points, and he didn't have to hire Sango for healing sessions, but he couldn't help but feel a bad taste in his mouth. Now, after the fight had ended, it was clearer than ever that Fall Hornet shouldn't have fought him. At that moment, he felt like he was Bishop and Fall Hornet was him. With this victory, Scars has established a 10-fight win streak, showing why he's one of the rising stars. Takuma stepped out of the arena while the announcer hyped him up. He didn't like to participate in the hype as it didn't serve a purpose for him as he didn't need his ego stroked after every win. But he couldn't lie that the 10-fight win stake felt pretty great, so great that he wondered if he should go out to celebrate. Ah, Scars, my prize boy. As soon as Takuma entered the tunnel, his mood soured upon hearing Sabira's voice greet him. His mood worsened when he saw the ring's boss' fat face. He wanted to punch it, but Sabura's two bodyguards prevented him from making a move. Why was Sabura here? I must commend you for your stellar performance, boy, Sabura said with his greasy smile. You're making people very happy with your fights. You mean I'm making you happy with my fights, Takuma snorted internally. Which is why I think it's a great time to take things to the next level, Sabura continued. It's time to make good on your contract, boy. It's time for you to breathe some new life into the 2v1 category. Takuma's eyes narrowed. It had been three months since Takuma had started his second contract with the ring, and in that time, he had jumped between the taijutsu and weapons categories, accumulating wins on his record. The opponents had gotten tougher, but so had he. The cream of the crop record was proof of it. Takuma attributed most of it to fear. He had become cautious now that he was in the Leaf Military Police Force, he had become more critical about his safety. He didn't want to walk into training rocking a visible injury and get questioned about it, he could use the training excuse a couple of times, but if it happened repeatedly, it'd be nothing but suspicion. He believed that the raised stakes had made him better at fighting. But now, with 2v1 introduced into the fray, Takuma felt the stakes rise once again. He felt the stress grow inside him, but he took it in. He could do it, he had gotten better. It's fitting, don't you think? 20th fight and a 10-fight win streak on the line at your 2v1 debut, said Sabira. I'm glad that the planning went well. Your next will be a memorable one. Takuma's eyes widened behind his mask. He realized why he had fought Fall Hornet today. He glared at Sabura as the bad taste in his mouth worsened. Chapter 110, Takuma's Advanced Skills Takuma sat on the sole bench in the fighter's tunnel. Beside him stood a ring employee standing, and one look told how tense he was, anyone would be tense while standing close to Takuma as he was now. Even though his face was hidden behind a mask, and the dark tunnel obscured his eyes, the vibe coming from the body language was heavy and oppressive. It couldn't be clearer that Takuma wasn't in a good mood. The fight will begin shortly, said the employee. Takuma nodded without looking up. His debut in the 2v1 category was supposed to be a momentous day, and he wished to be in peak condition for the fight, but for the past three days, his mood had been in flames ever since his last fight. If given a choice, Takuma wouldn't participate in the ring. And while aware of his feelings towards the ring, he was cognizant of the fact that, as it stood, his life revolved around the ring. His fights were arguably the most important part of his training, the majority of his income source, the reason behind why he sold drugs, and why he had to be so careful with everything about his personal life. Life could have been so much easier if the ring wasn't part of it, but he still did it because of his future. And perhaps it was because of that that Takuma took the ring quite seriously. Every victory brought money, but every fight also carried the risk of injury and death to him and the opponent, even though every fighter knew not to make mortal strikes, anything was possible in the heat of the battle. Strangely so, Takuma had developed a sense of pride in what he did. For him, it took a lot of work to perform in every battle. He had to train for it, 
ensure he was in tip-top condition for the fight, and then actually fight while keeping in mind to minimize injuries to reduce future risk and expenditure. Which made every win precious, making it hard-earned. So, when he realized that Sabura had rigged the fight against Fall Hornet to get him an easy win, that pride of his had been hurt. When he should have been happy for the quick and easy no-injury win, he felt the win was cheap. Takuma told himself he was needlessly caring about it too much, but no matter how much he repeated it to himself, he couldn't convince himself not to feel absolute shit. He didn't think he had been angrier in his life. He felt insulted. It's time, said the employee. Takuma stood up from his bench and walked to the exit. The announcer was finishing introducing the duo fighting him. He closed his eyes and focused on the crowd's noise and cheers, it was larger than usual, perhaps even larger than when he had fought Iron Bull, his biggest fight in the ring. The hype surrounding 2v1 was huge. The arena chosen for it was also one of the larger ones to accommodate the capacity. He hadn't been to the ring since last week, but he had heard one of his clients that he would watch and bet on the fight. Takuma heard his stage name called and walked out of the tunnel sedately. Immediately, the noise levels rose and hit him like a wall. He didn't look at anyone no matter how much they rattled the mesh walls around him, calmly walked into the arena, and only then did he look around and the crowd was indeed larger, people standing around banging shoulders against each other, screaming their throats out in anticipation of a bloody battle. Takuma had done public speaking a couple of times, and the eyes of the crowd had bothered him, but strangely enough, the crowd in the ring didn't do anything for him. He had fought in front of a paltry group of few and a packed crowd, they were both the same. When there was a person in front of you trying to break your bones or stick pointy metals in your body, there was no time to worry about crowds. He then finally looked at his opponents for the day. Seeing two people in the arena other than him was somewhat strange. He hadn't seen a 2v1 fight due to their rarity, the few times they were held, he wasn't free to go and watch them. Adding one more person made the large arena feel smaller, which was true when you considered how much distance an average person could cover and command. But he did know his opponents. The ring informed the fighters about their opponents beforehand. When Takuma was new, the competition he was fighting was bottom of the barrel, so not much information was available about them. However, as he collected wins and the fights got more formidable, the opposition also rose in quality and thus had more details about them due to their popularity. The ring staff also got friendlier when he signed his second contract, giving him tips and tricks when he dropped by the offices after every fight. Takuma was genuinely able to understand why ring fighters joined teams. He squatted down as he stared at his opponents. Two men. One of them had a simple red circle on the plane mask where the nose was supposed to be, and the source of his name, Clown Nose. And his partner for the fight, Stonehands, a name that allegedly came from abnormally large hands, disproportionate to the man's height and better suited someone seven feet tall, big enough to palm a basketball comfortably. Both of them were on their second contract, each having more fights than him, but they had records worse than him. From what the announcer had announced, it seemed both had a sub-50% win record. It made sense for them to have a worse record than him. It wouldn't make sense from a betting perspective if both members of the duo were of the same level as the solo opponent. A balance needed to be struck so that the audience could see both sides winning, two people working together to defeat a stronger opponent or a comparatively stronger fighter edging out a victory against two people working together in tandem, only then would the betting odds work. Takuma kept his eyes on his opponents, who whispered to each other, because of their masks, Takuma couldn't read their lips, and the crowd noise made it impossible to eavesdrop. But he was able to read some of their body language. They haven't made a plan, thought Takuma. He stood up and walked towards them as soon as the announcer began to walk towards the exit. Seeing Takuma suddenly move, Clown Nose and Stone Hands broke their conversation and moved away from each other, taking positions in a hurried manner. As it was Takuma's first 2v1 fight, Sabura had made it in the Taijutsu subcategory, meaning weapons weren't allowed. Takuma clenched his fist as his stride widened, and he was sprinting by the time the announcer stepped out. Stone Hands ran forward and stood in front of Clown Nose, who began to move sideways. 
Takuma saw stone hands raise his massive hands into fists, ready in a fighting stance to engage him in a battle. But Takuma didn't slow down, and the moment he was in Stonehand's range, Takuma leaped over Stonehand's head, passing him without a confrontation. Wah! Takuma didn't look back at Stonehand's and zoned in towards Clown Nose, who was taken by surprise. Takuma did a short hop and planted a spinning kick that was blocked but followed by two more kicks before his feet touched, one of which caught Clown Nose in the hip. Ugh! Clown Nose grunted lightly, but the kick didn't seem to do much damage as he whipped out a punch towards Takuma's face that he dodged by shifting his head to the side and followed by an uppercut body shot, digging his fist below Clown Nose's chest. Clown Nose's body folded, opening up opportunities to deal more damage to Clown Nose, but Takuma was aware that he was fighting two people. He grabbed Clown Nose's shoulders with both hands and fell on the floor, pulling Clown Nose with him before kicking Clown Nose over him. Stone hands, who was rushing towards Clown Nose and Takuma, was again met by an unexpected surprise when he saw Clown Nose thrown towards him. Stone Hands had no choice but to catch his teammate instead of attacking Takuma. Are you alright? he asked. Clown Nose replied. Why ya, yeah, I'm good. Let's, but before he could even finish his sentence, Stone Hands pushed him to the side. It was because Stone Hands saw Takuma over Clown Nose's shoulder. Takuma took a quick step towards the duo and wanted to hit Clown Nose on his back, but when he saw Stone Hands push Clown Nose away, his eyes flashed, and he simply changed the target. His tense arm shot out with chakra flowing through the muscles, augmenting a devastating strength in the strike. Bang! Stone Hands' arms raised to block met Takuma's fist. He couldn't stay on his feet and shot back like a cannonball from the force that screamed out of Takuma's chakra augmentation. The crowd raised a crazed ruckus, filling the underground with an energy that could only be seen in a gladiator arena. Despite the successful attack, Takuma clicked his tongue. His skill with chakra augmentation had come a long way since he had first broken his arm using it, and the recent fights in the taijutsu categories especially had helped him grow the skill. While he was far from perfect, and the augmentation still backfired occasionally, his control had surged. And with that skill increase, Takuma added another layer of experimentation to the chakra augmentation. He had begun trying to focus the burst of chakra that surged out on impact in an effort to concentrate the damage into a shorter area. But it hadn't gone that way right now, and instead of the chakra concentrating into a shorter area, it had expanded, thus diluting the damage over a larger area, which had sent Stonehands flying instead of perhaps inflicting a tiny hairline fracture into Stonehands' arms. Takuma didn't ponder the moment and turned to Clown Nose and charged him. They hadn't communicated beforehand, and from what Takuma understood, the best way to manage a 2v1 fight was to separate them and then deal with them one at a time. Clown Nose had enough time to gather himself and was ready when Takuma came at him, and within an instant, they exchanged strikes with speeds that blurred their arms to the untrained eye. Clown Nose screwed a punch into Takuma's side, but not without Takuma striking a palm strike behind Clown Nose's ear. Takuma stumbled a few steps due to the pain in his side, but he bit the inside of his cheek when he saw Clown Nose grabbing the side of his head in pain. He skipped a step forward and launched a Taekwondo-style high side kick that dug Takuma's clipped Clown Nose's chin before digging into the throat. Takuma felt a wave of exhilaration shoot through him that erased all the anger he was feeling from before the fight. He never knew the feeling of landing a satisfying strike before coming to this world, but after over two years of learning combat, he cherished every time he got to experience a perfectly executed strike. There were few things that could match that experience. Even before Clown Nose collapsed to the ground, Takuma knew that he was done. And as he expected, Clown Nose crumbled flat down on the arena floor. Takuma turned away from Clown Nose and faced Stone Hands. He didn't rush towards, and neither did Stone Hands, whose arms were now trembling. Both of them knew that the dynamics of the fight had changed, with Clown Nose out of the game, the fight was no longer 2v1. It was now a regular fight, but a regular fight between two fighters who weren't on the same level. Takuma didn't take the foot off the pedal and charge for Stone Hands, who shook his hands and got ready for the clash. Takuma took to the air with his legs stretched forward, but before it could hit, 
Stonehand's giant claws grabbed onto Takuma's leg, and he swung Takuma around with surprising strength. The giant hand wrapped around Takuma's ankle like a cuff. Takuma had his entire balance and momentum stripped from him, but while he was being pulled midair, his eyes were trained on Stonehand's, giving him a place to focus. He bent his knees, and before he was slammed to the ground, he snapped a kick into Stonehand's upper chest. Stonehand's grip loosened around Takuma's ankle, but the momentum was already enough to slam Takuma into the arena floor, knocking all the air out of his lungs. He freed his foot from Stonehand's grip but was left in a worse position than him. It took a moment for both fighters to recover before they were back into the fight. Stonehand's went for a stomp that Takuma avoided with a roll to the side and immediately struck out with a sweeping kick to take out Stonehand's legs, getting him to the ground. Takuma immediately rolled to the side and jumped on Stonehand's back, and the next moment, one of his arms snaked around Stonehand's neck while the other arm locked the head in between two arms before Takuma began applying pressure. Stonehand's must have felt the danger from what was happening as he started to thrash around while trying to get Takuma off his back, but Takuma wasn't going to let the opportunity go as he needs Stonehand's in the back while increasing the pressure around Stonehand's neck. Rard. Stonehand's tried to stand up and with his superior strength, he was able to stand up with Takuma on his back with legs wrapped around his waist. But the moment Stonehands was able to stabilize himself, his eyes partially rolled up, and he stumbled back for a couple of steps before falling again with Takuma, not letting the pressure around the neck go. Stonehands' hands clawed for Takuma's arm for a few moments before the entire body went limp. Takuma let go of Stonehands and stood up with labored breathing while looking down at Stonehands and then at the unconscious clown nose in the distance. And then he raised his arm, which the crowd took as the signal to go cause an underground earthquake. Chapter 111 Takuma's Insane Progression Takuma sighed as he knocked on the heavy metal door, uncharacteristic of a grocery store's back door. The sun had long set down, and he was hungry because he hadn't had the time to have dinner, but here he was, hungry and exhausted after a day's worth of hard work, most of it spent outside under the sun. He heard a pair of footsteps that abruptly stopped. The slot in the door slid open, and the man behind the door sighed before opening the door. Unfortunately, the guard behind the door wasn't the only one in the corridor, another man stood in the middle of the corridor. He and Takuma met eyes, and almost straight away, the other man clicked his tongue upon seeing Takuma and walked past him, exiting the building with a displeased face. Takuma didn't say anything or acknowledge the man and simply fixed the mask over his face that imparted him another identity. The fact that he hid his face didn't sit well with many of the dealers under Ryu, they didn't like to be so closely connected to someone they didn't know anything about. Takuma couldn't blame them, and as long as they didn't mess with him, he didn't mind facing their displeased reactions from time to time. However, if they tried to disrupt his business, he would find where it hurt most and strike them there. Ria's grocery store acted as a front for his drug-dealing business. The first floor ran a profitable grocery business, while the basement was the drug shop that racked in even more, selling a commodity with a demand that never seemed to dwindle. Takuma walked down the familiar stairs to the basement almost every week to renew his stash. It was a bother to visit every week, so much so that he had arrived today to increase his order so that he could cut his visits to every other week. In the basement, one of Ryo's men acknowledged Takuma. Late, aren't you, Toby? While many disliked Takuma, he wasn't without friends. Some people were civil with him, and he usually only interacted with people. Works a bitch, said Takuma, his voice distorted. He handed the man two thick stacks of cash and told him the order. Oh? This is more than usual, said the man as he counted the cash, and you're getting more of the better stuff today, huh? Got me a few folks who can afford the better stuff, replied Takuma. There were different strains of weed, some more potent, some providing a different experience than others, people had their preferences, and they had their budgets. Recently, Takuma had found a few clients who could afford the better stuff, and he was more than happy to fulfill their demands because the better quality always had a better margin. The man took out the produce, weighed it, and packed them in Ziploc bags before handing them to Takuma, who double-packed them in heavy-duty Ziploc bags. With the exchange done, Takuma was about to leave when the man spoke to him. 
The boss wanted to see you. Takuma looked deeper into the large basement where a small office made from sheet metal stood. After their first meeting, Takuma had only met Ryu occasionally, once a month on average. Other than those, he usually only dealt with Ryu's underlings who worked directly for him. Why? asked Takuma. Did he say why he wanted to meet me? The man shrugged his shoulders as he marked some entries into a ledger. If he did, he didn't tell me. You should hurry, it's already late, and I doubt he'll be happy if you keep him waiting much longer. Takuma sighed. He was tired and wanted to go home, but he couldn't say no to his supplier. He walked to the office and knocked on the door. Come in. Takuma stepped inside the room and was immediately hit by a sweet smell lingering in the room. His eyes went to a candle sitting in the corner of the room, releasing wisps of smoke. It was a special-made candle, crazy effective at getting rid of smells, one of Takuma's best-selling accessories that he had to buy from another shop to sell to his clients. You wanted to meet? he asked. Sit, Ryu said from behind his desk. He read an old leather book with a title that Takuma couldn't spot because of the faded leather. How's the business going? Decent, said Takuma. Ryu chuckled, don't say that to other people. What's this about? In a hurry, are you? Ryu looked up from his book. It's getting late, and I'm sure both of us want to return home now. That's why I like you, kid. So straight to the point, it's refreshing, Ryu closed the book and looked up at Takuma. I want you to do something for me. I refuse, Takuma directly shot down the topic. We are supplier and dealer. I pay you up front, and you give me the product. There's no need for anything to be added to our dynamic. Well, things change, kid. It's the natural world order, said Ryu, unperturbed, and if I say I want you to do something for me, you don't have a choice in the matter. Takuma's eyes narrowed behind his mask. What if I refuse? he asked. Takuma didn't see this coming. Until he had stepped into the office, nothing had given him any inkling regarding the current situation. He would have prepared in some ways if he had seen it coming. Even though he didn't know what Ryu was asking him, Takuma did not doubt that it would be bothersome. If you refuse, we end our little business right here, said Ryu with a smile. I like you, kid, but you aren't an easy one to work with. In our business, trust is everything, and there are things that give substance to that trust, which you don't really have. I love working with you, and you're a good customer, but the fact remains that I know nothing about you, and you know everything about me, who I am, where I work, who I deal with. That's not fair, don't you think? Simply put, I need the incentive to put myself at this risk. Takuma felt his heart grow heavy. He had finally begun to feel comfortable with dealing and had built a good amount of repeat customers who were coming back in their cycles, which brought him a reliable income. He had moved to a new stage in his career and life, however, things hadn't changed much from before. Before Takuma had joined Arika's team, he was like any Jinin Corp Jinin who took a comfortable base pay and tried to bolster it with a day-in day-out series of D-rank missions that paid peanuts. Then Inomoto gave him the ticket to the ring, another avenue to additional income, which he didn't see for three months, but at that time, he didn't have a need for it, and when the bulk pay hit, he had utilized the mission points to buy himself a new set of shiny jutsu while keeping the cash in the bank to collect some interest. However, that money wasn't given the time to collect as the entry to the ring's weapons category brought an additional expense in the form of Sango's treatments. With a bump in lethality, he needed support that would allow him to keep fighting and maintain a normal life, but that support was costly, and it quickly ate into that cash pool sitting in the bank. If it were just that, Takuma wouldn't have many problems. His other source of income was enough for a comfortable life, not one of luxury and indulgence, but one where he wasn't sacrificing basic creature comforts, the stable infusion of C-rank missions under Irika brought an income higher than most Jinin Corp Jinin. However, he had more expenditures. Ring provided him an opportunity to improve his combat prowess while earning, other skills weren't so giving. Improvements cost money. Learning new things cost money. If he wanted to work on his shuriken jutsu skills, he needed to book training facilities with moving targets, 
plus the buying and maintenance costs of kunai and shuriken that would chip and bend after repeated use. Locksmithing required him to buy new locks to keep himself up to date. Working on safes had him pay experienced locksmiths for their time and access to safes to practice on. Training facilities for his work toward seeing in low visibility while fighting with the hidden Miss Jutsu cost money. New high-quality maps for cartography were costly as he built his collection, and maps weren't the only things he had gotten in the habit of collecting. Takuma was even learning how to ride a horse on the weekends because no other shinobi seemingly knew how to, and he thought it to be a unique skill in case he needed to pretend to be a civilian merchant. He had recently enrolled himself in a class that taught how to work a field radio for communication and had bought himself a second-hand radio for practice that took a lot of space in his small house. Similarly, he had worked on Morse code proficiency during his first year as a genin, which had similarly cost money. He attended the first aid and other field emergency treatment classes in hospitals for practice because the last time he had stuffed gauze into an open wound in a foreign land, it was overly messy, revealing that attending those classes once wasn't enough and that he needed practice. Those classes were quite affordable, but they still cost some money. There were ten other things that poked tiny prick-sized holes in the water bag known as his real reserves. Working in the police force came with yet another set of requirements that had him learn new things, the training period had felt like he was back in school with a lot of theoretical and practical learning regarding how to investigate and process crimes and the shinobi law. He had books that the police force gave him free of cost, and his status as a shinobi and police force member granted him access to the general shinobi libraries and the police force archives, but that didn't mean he didn't need to buy new books which he always needed on hand due to their importance. Those books, once again, were expensive. In this world, Takuma realized how lucky he had access to the internet, where he could access a seemingly infinite amount of free information and knowledge at his fingertips, without that all-important utility, accessing various resources cost money if he wanted to learn anything. If he could choose one motto to live his life by, then it would be Mariboshi's words that Takuma spoke to himself every day. A shinobi is more than the chakra he wields. And thus, he couldn't stop learning. He couldn't afford to let go of the drug-dealing money because it freed money that enabled him to continue learning. The police force might have been a big step forward for his career, but when it came from a monetary standpoint, Takuma had only gotten a 15% pay hike from his team Irika days, the police force had used their reputation and the current political unrest to lowball their new recruits, who couldn't say anything in the face of the great opportunity they were given. Takuma was one of the lucky ones, the special recruits, who had gotten a pay hike, most of them were either earning as much or in some rare cases lower than before. He was satisfied with what the police force did for his resume, but he really expected them to pay him more. Mission points might be an important currency in the world of Shinobi, but cold hard cash, Rio, still made the world go around. Civilians and practically every career Jinin preferred Rio because the former couldn't use mission points, and the latter no longer used mission points as much. Mission points could be used to buy equipment and other things, but Takuma had decided to earmark every single mission point for jutsu purchases, and nothing else. He had even fucked himself in the short term by the terms of his ring contract. It was biased towards mission points over Rio. From per fight winnings, to win streak bonuses, his contract made sure it would maximize his mission points. It was good for him in the long run, but not so much when he looked at the short term. As it stood, Takuma was not living paycheck to paycheck with close to no Rio savings, but he cut it close every month, and he didn't care about savings that much as he thought investing himself was better, but that didn't mean he didn't understand the importance of saving money for a rainy day. Street dealing, with its lean margins, had finally begun to grow to a level that he could actually save a little bit. He weighed the pros and cons, and the result told him that the best possible thing for him was to stay with Ria and continue. Changing things now would halt his business, tear his clients away from him, and would set him back several steps that would be a pain to climb back up. So be it, said Takuma as he stood up. He would build his business back up. Short it may be, but it was a good run. I wish you continued success. He would go to Inomoto and have the Chunin introduce him to one of the other suppliers under Inomoto. Ria wasn't the only one who bought from Inomoto, 
there were a couple more suppliers who bought from Inomoto. Did you ever think why Inomoto brought you to me? Ria asked as Takuma turned his back to him. Takuma paused with his hand on the doorknob. You've been doing this long enough to understand how unique your position is. Do you think someone else would be willing to work with you without knowing your identity? Do you believe Inomoto would vouch for you another time? Takuma bit the inside of his cheek. He couldn't deny Ria's pointed questions. In the several months he had been dealing, he hadn't met a single dealer, no matter the supplier, who hid their identity as he did. It was because of Inomoto's vouching that Ryu accepted Takuma. And as Ria said, the chances of Inomoto vouching for him another time might not work if the supplier didn't want to work with Takuma. Inomoto couldn't, wouldn't, force them. It was bad business. As far as I know, I was the only one even willing to meet with you when Inomoto told us about your condition, Ryu continued. How do you think it'll look to others on the outside when they see me and you fall out? It'd be terrible. As Takuma began to rethink his decision, he realized that he was being overly optimistic. His one advantage had become the biggest hindrance, keeping him from moving on. At the same time, he didn't want to slow down his progress as a shinobi. He was in the police force, and from his chance meeting with Naruto, he knew the little blonde was already in the academy. Takuma didn't know when the Uchiha massacre would happen, but he knew it was close. He had to keep learning, make himself more valuable. Sit down, kid. If you leave now, even if you agree later, the offer will be closed, Ryu said. The way I see it, you get to keep your identity a secret, and I get a little something out of it. Disagree if you will, but this is your best option. You're a shinobi, treat me as a patron and what I ask you as a mission. It's simple if you look at it that way. In return, just like a patron, I'll pay you in the form of a discount on the product. Takuma disagreed wholeheartedly, but he sat down. What's the job? he asked. I want you to deliver something across the village. Why can't your people do it? Because my men are known for their association with me. We can't be connected to this. You, on the other hand, are an unknown, change your look a little bit and drop the package at the destination, nothing more, nothing less. What's in the package? The less you know, the better for everyone, said Ryu. This has been great. Takuma stood up. I'll not do a job if I don't know everything about it. He understood where Ryu was coming from, but after the Land of Frost, he preferred to know more, even if that knowledge later became a curse later on. Ria didn't say anything. Takuma shrugged and moved to exit the office. It was a pity that he would no longer be able to work with Ryu, as that was the most stable thing for him in the drug business. He knew that the chances of getting another supplier were on the floor. Even if he revealed his identity and became like every other dealer wouldn't work because when people knew that he was in the police force, they wouldn't touch him with a ten-feet pole. It was over, he would find some way else to earn more, or else cut down his classes. Soldier pills and other medicinal mixtures. Takuma's lips curled briefly up behind his mask before he turned back and sat down. Who's the recipient? asked Takuma. You're to drop the package in a location. Someone will collect it after you're gone, said Ryu. Takuma let the room sit in silence as he matched his eyes with Ryu. Ryu sighed, are you sure you want to know, kid? Sometimes it's better not to know and leave things behind. I don't want to do this, but if you're going to have me do this job, I need you to answer all of my questions, said Takuma. The Maiko Triad answered Ryu. Takuma's eyes narrowed when he heard the name. He knew about the Maiko Triads from both his time as a dealer and from the information binders he had to memorize during the police force training period. They were dangerous people, some very not nice shinobi. Takuma's eyes shined. All right, let's do this he said. I knew you wouldn't refuse me, kid, Ria's words along with a few chuckles followed Takuma as he walked out of the office. Takuma looked up at the starry sky outside and sighed as he lit a blunt. He had agreed with Ryu, but that didn't mean he was going to do it. From the looks of it, he most probably was going to do it, but not before he paid Inomoto a visit to see if he could get some help from that avenue before he was forced to fulfill his commitment. 
He felt twice as fatigued as before, but his appetite had been thoroughly killed. Chapter 122 Policeman Investigation Takuma clicked his tongue as he stomped into Ring's medical room with a nasty cut on his dangling and dripping right arm held into place by his left. A gambit not paying up and instead resulting in failure was one of the worst feelings during a battle, especially when the result was losing the dominant arm and dangerous blood loss. He deposited himself onto a backless stool, wordlessly, curtains created a boundary, hiding him from the rest of the room. Frustrated about his loss, Takuma removed his mask and chucked it at the curtain. Grumpy today, are we, Sango said as she attached the Velcro tabs to seal the curtains. Takuma removed his sweaty ski mask and dropped it unceremoniously on the table. He had lost his winning streak, his winnings per fight were going to reset to the base state without the streak bonus, and his dominant arm was going to feel weak for a couple of days, he felt like smashing things to ease the frustration bubbling inside him. Instead, he just closed his eyes as Sango patched up his arm in silence. Eventually, he asked, what did he say? He says he's busy, Sango replied. This either meant that Inomoto didn't want to meet or didn't want anything to do with the conflict between Ryu and Takuma. Takuma held back a sigh as the answer stroked the flames of his frustration. The relationship between Takuma and Inomoto was one controlled by Inomoto, most of their interactions were initiated with Inomoto, leaving Takuma without a way to contact Inomoto. So, the last time Takuma had wanted to contact Inomoto, he had done it through Sango, so this time as well, he had done the same. In case Inomoto was actually busy, Takuma couldn't wait for a time to open up an Inomoto schedule, as Ria had already given him the date when the delivery needed to go down. It seemed he had no choice but to go through the delivery. Take this. Sango gave him a little sachet of a rusty brown powder. Mix it with a glass of water and down it in a gulp because it tastes horrible. Takuma took the sachet, stared at the contents inside, and felt the gears turn in his mind. He looked up at Sango, who was cleaning up the table. Hey, he said, I might have a job for you. This is it. Takuma looked at the two large black duffel bags on the floor. Don't screw this up. If this doesn't reach the Myco Triad, you're going to be the one to blame. Then both us and them will come hunt you down, and it won't be good for you, you bastard. You better not screw up. Takuma ignored the chatter, knelt beside the duffel bags, and began checking the straps and zip of the bags to check their durability and find the weak points. He then stepped away and pointed at the bags. Open them, he said. What? Takuma glanced at one of Ryu's underlings and pointed at the bags. Open them. I want to see what's inside. He had to verify Ryu's words about the contents being soldier pills and medicinal mixtures before he sent them across the village and to ensure the bags were Bobby trapped in any way. Show it to him, said one of the underlings further back. The underling near Takuma clicked his tongue and unzipped both bags to reveal packs over packs of soldier pills, medicinal mixtures, and even some vials with liquids. There's no seal, Takuma noted. The underling scoffed, happy? Takuma wasn't happy. He knelt beside the bags and dug his hands deep inside to check every corner to ensure nothing was hidden underneath. Looks about right said Takuma and zipped everything back on his own so they wouldn't be able to sneak anything at the last moment. Give me the location, he asked. He got a piece of paper with the address that was burned immediately after Takuma memorized the address. All right, I'll get going. Takuma adjusted the ski mask on his face. Today, he didn't have a rigid front mask and simply put on a ski mask with black paint around his eyes and mouth to cover everything. He stepped out of the building different from Ria's grocery store. They had arranged the pickup spot to be away from Ria's store so there wouldn't be any connection in case someone was looking. By the time Takuma stepped out, the sun was already down, and the sky was perhaps half an hour from turning completely dark. Takuma didn't take the shortest to the destination and instead ran around the village, popping in and out of streets and alleyways, even sometimes running into crowds under the guise of transformation jutsu, which he changed every couple of minutes. It was a standard practice to lose a tail which Takuma wasn't sure he had, 
but he still spent an entire twenty minutes running around the village until he was satisfied that he didn't have someone following him. He couldn't use Earth Release, Earth Tremor Sense Jutsu because of the village's population density and architecture. There were too many people for him to tell if someone was following him, and even if he went somewhere deserted, the Jutsu couldn't sense if people were on the buildings. After he was sure no one was following him, Takuma entered a random building and went to the top of the staircase, where he sat down and opened the duffel bags. He took out a couple of the soldier pills, one of each mixture, and took out fresh vials from his person and took a drop or two out of a few filled vials for each medicinal liquid. He sampled everything that was available and stored it on his person before repacking everything, leaving no proof that something had tampered with the product. The quantity of everything was so much that he was sure they wouldn't notice anything was missing. Once he was done, Takuma once again stepped out of the building, and only then did he make a beeline towards the destination. He had only been to this part of the village a few times, and most of it was in passing, but he knew that it was a little inside the edge of the Maiko Triad's territory. Takuma entered the block stealthily, covering his tracks, and applying every trick and tip he had learned in his time as a shinobi. From one street across, Takuma looked at an abandoned building through a pair of binoculars. It was difficult to make out much due to the dark sky and the lack of light, but he wanted to see if there was anyone inside the building. He was asked to drop the bags in the middle of the second floor, after which his job was done. Takuma spotted a half-open window on the third floor and decided it would be his entry point. He hopped on the roof before putting power and chakra in his legs that launched him to the side of the building. His feet met the side, and immediately chakra grabbed onto the surface. He didn't make any noise, but still moved into the building in case someone looked up. The building seemed to be like every other dilapidated building Takuma had seen, which was a strange thing to have seen, but Takuma had seen several of them around his neighborhood. He located the staircase and silently stepped onto the second floor, where he couldn't detect any presence. He threw a rock to see if he could make someone hiding flinch, but nothing made a peep or shuffle. After a while, Takuma finally let his shoulders drop and walked to the middle of the floor, where he gently placed the bags before leaving the building the same way he came in. He didn't stop to look at who would come to collect the delivery because he knew that even if someone wasn't inside the building, someone around the block was keeping an eye, he didn't even need to check. If Takuma were confident in his stealth ability, he would have hung around, but he wasn't, and he didn't like the chances of combat in case he was met with multiple combatants in an area unfamiliar to him. It was a pity, but he already got what he needed. The winds that day were cold, bringing a little relief to the heat of the summer. Takuma sat across from Sango in a restaurant of her choice. Of course, like every time they ate together, it was his treat. If it were another girl, he would have only treated someone this much if he was trying to court her, but in the case of the girl in front of him, these dinners were mostly strictly business. So, show them to me, Sango asked after placing her order. Takuma took out the samples he had stolen from the delivery and placed them on the table. Sango picked the pouches and vials and observed them with lazy eyes that had a sharp gaze in them. Can you tell me who made these? asked Takuma. Possibly, if there isn't anything special about them, but I need to test them to know the specifics, said Sango. Why do you want to know? Takuma shrugged, not giving an answer. It'd cost you, she said. I'm ready to pay. Mission points, Sango interjected. Takuma's eyes sharpened. He wanted to call it off, but at the same time, he didn't have a choice. Sango was the only person he could go to. He knew two other Irionin, but both of them were non-options. He didn't want to involve Inomoto, and he couldn't explain to Taro's dad why he wanted to know where the unknown samples came from. Applying for an identification request in the police force would be too risky if he was asked to explain the origin of the samples. Thus, Sango. Half in mission points, half in Rio, he said. Mission points, she repeated. Takuma wanted to groan but kept his expression straight. Okay, but only if you find a match. If you fail, I won't pay jack shit, he said. Sango glared at him as if she felt insulted. Takuma didn't mind. If he was going to pay in precious mission points, then he wanted guaranteed results. 
Okay, she said. Takuma narrowed his eyes, but shrugged. Sango pulled the menu that she had pushed away earlier and called. Waiter! This bitch. Takuma walked into the police force's archives, not the one with all the informational books, but the one with the case files and information dossiers. He patiently filled out a form and joined the short line at the counter with other police force members who were there with their objectives. When his time came, he passed the form to the person behind the counter. What do you want? asked the man as he browsed the form. Takuma answered. Whatever you can give me about the Myko Triad. Chapter 113, Arisu Arisu stared at the man slumped against the wall with no life in his eyes. The numerous gashes and bruises, the kunai handle sticking out of the chest, and the blood on and around the body told a story of a struggle better than any amount of words could. It was a horrifying sight, but Arisu continued to stare in an effort to find the chain of events that had led to this. Turning away from the man, she looked to the middle of the building's ground floor lobby, where another body lay with a sword sticking out gut, surrounded by a pool of blood staining the dirty gray floor. Two dead men on the ground floor of the apartment complex didn't come as a surprise to her. She had seen many similar situations, especially in the type of neighborhood they were called to. And the blade tracks and shuriken in the walls, soul prints on the ceiling, and light jutsu damage around the scene made it evident they were dealing with shinobi. What a waste, she sighed to herself. Arisu saw Kano enter the building and walked to the second man to join Takuma. Is everything tagged? asked Kano. Yes, ma'am, Arisu replied. Takuma, who was observing the second man, pointed over at the dead body with a pen as he spoke, brutal. A lot of bruising on the front of the neck, from the lower leg I can tell that the other guy was really trying to hobble this one by striking the calf and knee, and look at this, Takuma pointed at the man's left eye, he even tried to poke the eye out, that other guy was trying to impair him to get in the murder strike. Straight for the liver. Takuma touched the sword blade with his pen, making a ting against the metal. Same for that one, Arisa pointed at the man against the wall. Any signs of a third party? asked Kano. Arisu shook her head. No, from the looks of it, only these two were involved. The wounds and state of the violence around the scene were congruent to a scene created by two people fighting each other. We will have to look deeper after tagging everything to know for sure. Kano squatted by the dead body and observed in silence for a minute before sighing. Well, haven't we seen this before, she sighed. Takuma titled his head. Any identification? Kano asked. We got one of them, Arisu held up the shinobi registration card she got from the dead shinobi. Takuma held up the same for the second guy. Good. Yup, this checks out. Let's wrap this up, Kano took the registration cards from them. What was that about? Arisu asked as Kano walked away to the other body. Takuma stared at Kano. From the looks of it, he also found her behavior strange, but he shrugged. She will tell us later. Come on, I want to get out of here, he said. Arisu frowned. It was Kano who had told them to come to the crime scene to inspect it. And she knew that the homicide wasn't swamped and that they had to shift caseload to other departments. It wasn't that organized crime didn't handle killings, in fact, they handled more killings than homicide due to the fact that there were a lot of deaths connected to organized crime. The fact that Kano had ordered them meant she knew the connection. Why not tell us right away, she thought. We got confirmation on the identity from the two we found in the Rabani building, Kano said to Arisu and Takuma after calling them into her office. Arisu furrowed her brows a smidge. They already knew the two men from their shinobi registration, and they had already gone to their houses and talked to their neighbors about them. She was confused as to what confirmation Kano was talking about. I see you're confused, Kano said to Arisu, surprising her. Yes. What's this about, ma'am? Close the door, Kano said to Takuma, who stood up and closed the office door. I will preface what I'm about to tell you by saying that you are not allowed to discuss what I'm about to tell you with anyone outside the force. Don't gossip about it with others if it's unrelated to a case, and if you have any questions, come to me, and I'll tell you what you need to know. 
Arisu was even more confused but stood up straighter as she was about to get some answers. In a couple days of the investigation, the case seemed to be an open and shut case, with the two shinobi killing each other over some conflict. The friends of one man didn't know the other, and neither did their close mission team members and peers, which did raise questions about the reason behind the fight. They hadn't found the signs of a third party on the crime scene, but that didn't mean there wasn't one involved indirectly. The crime scene was called the Rabani Building, a cheap apartment building in one of the downtrodden and low-income districts of the Hidden Leaf. Neither men's home were anywhere near the Rabani Building, and after some digging around, they found that one of the men was seeing a woman who lived in the building. After they interrogated her, the woman admitted that she knew one of the men but refused to knowing the other one. From the looks of it, she wasn't lying. So, they eliminated the theory of a love triangle gone wrong. One of the theories they were considering was of an assassination. One of the shinobi was asked to kill another one. It was illegal, and the punishments were severe for the person issuing the hit and the assassin, but it still happened here and there in a village full of shinobi. Orisu was following that theory and had asked for their bank records to see if she could find something there they were supposed to be delivered tomorrow afternoon. We will be closing the investigation, Kano's words snapped Arisu out of her thoughts. The two killed each other, that's it. What? Why? Arisu stood up from her chair. Sit down, I'm not done yet, Kano said. Arisu reluctantly sat down and stared hard at Kano, her eyes demanding an answer. Kano sighed. Those two were part of something called the ring. Do you know what that is? Ring? Arisu shook her head. No, what is it? It's an underground gladiator arena where shinobi fight each other in front of an audience for money, Kano's words shocked Arisu. Those two were fighters in the ring, and one of our contacts in the ring tells us that they had a fight a week back. The loss didn't sit well with Kimoto, and well, he decided to have a rematch. The contact tells us that Kimoto was very dissatisfied with the fight and wanted to reschedule one, but the ring refused to do any time soon, which might have led him to find Mihara at his side piece's home. Now you have the motive, and from the crime scene, we don't see a third-party involvement. A clear close and shut case. Process it as such. Arisu was shocked and turned to look at Takuma, who looked to be taking in the information. How? Is that still going on? Arisu asked. She knew for a fact that shinobi weren't allowed to fight each other as a sport. Any sort of underground combat was prohibited. And from Kano's words, she clearly knew about it, the police force knew about it. If they knew about it, why had they let something like that exist? It's an open secret of sorts. We know about it, but we don't do anything about it because we are told to do so, Kano explained. It's used as a tool to train hidden leaf shinobi's combat preparedness. The fighters that fight each other get better due to the exposure to the combat and earn while doing it, allowing them further to grow stronger if they wish to do so. Helps a lot of clanless shinobi develop. Arisu once again glanced at Takuma beside her. He must have noticed him looking at her because he looked back. He didn't have much expression on his face, but that was him most of the time. Takuma turned back to Kano. He asked, You identified them instantly when you arrived at the scene. Did you know one of them or both from before and that they were from the ring? I didn't know them. Then how? It doesn't happen often, but we do see cases like this. I've seen a few of them in the last few years. The ring fighters all fight a certain way, influenced by each other, it keeps changing year by year, but some things are carried over. I have formed an eye for the injuries which ring fighters usually inflict, it's not anything unique and there are other unrelated cases with similar injuries, so we usually confirm with our contact inside the ring. But this time, we were given the information by our contact beforehand that an incident had happened. Arisu was still reeling from the discovery of an apparent underground gladiator. She had lived her entire life in the hidden leaf, and to suddenly find out that there was something so big was jarring when her first exposure to it was through a double murder. How big is it? she asked. Bigger than you might think, said Kano. It has been here in the village for a long time. You'll find people older than me and people as young as you in the ring. 
Fuck me, Arisa cursed. Takuma asked, This ring. What is our relationship with them? Not much. We know to ignore their operations, and they make sure not to come to the surface. When cases like this and some others do arise, they provide us with anything we want to make them go away because that's good for both of us. Do we have a list of the ring fighters on file? Takuma asked. Kano shook her head. Takuma leaned against the chair. He was done asking questions. Arisu asked a few questions before they left Kano's office. You don't seem too surprised by the ring, Arisu said to Takuma, not anywhere close to as she was. Takuma sat down at his desk. I've heard about something like that existed. Didn't think it was real, but can't say I'm that surprised to know now it's real, you know. He looked at her. You get to hear a lot of things when you live in a place where I do. Arisu knew where Takuma lived. It was in the opposite direction from where she lived. She had never been to the area where Takuma had lived but had seen areas like that while on cases. It wasn't a good place to live, and she didn't know why someone like him would continue to live there. She couldn't imagine living in a place like that. Would you have joined the ring? Arisu asked. Kano said that it helps a lot of clanless shinobi help them develop. Takuma laughed. He looked up at her and pointed at his arm where the Red Police Force armband sat. I'm part of the Leaf Military Police Force, an officer of the esteemed Organized Crime Division, do you think I can be in any better place to develop as a shinobi? Arisu couldn't deny his words. Except under a Jonin teacher, the police force was perhaps the place to be. As she looked at Takuma, Arisu couldn't help but remember the Takuma of the past when they were in the academy. Dead last. Someone who couldn't hit a target, win a spar, cast a jutsu, if his life depended on it. Someone who had failed the academy graduation test twice before passing at the last chance. Takuma hadn't even been given a chance to try out for a jonin and was directly put into the jinin corp. Seeing that guy in the same place as her after two years honestly made her feel insecure. She couldn't help but compare her to him and couldn't help but wonder if her effort was lacking in comparison to Takuma. I want to finish the damn paperwork as soon as possible, said Takuma as he tidied up his desk. Arisu shook her head and got herself back together. There was no use thinking about those things. If she felt she was lacking, then all she had to do was up the work she was putting in. Yeah, let's do this. Chapter 114 Suspicious Individuals Inside a locker room in the underground expanse of the ring, two men prepared for their upcoming fight in silence. As dictated by the tradition and rules, they wore simple clothing, a pair of shorts, the two mask set that hid their identity, and a pair of arm and shin guards allowed in the weapons category. How do you feel? asked Smoking Tiger. My dear is feeling happy today, replied the other man, Razor, as he stroked his unsheathed sword with gentle caresses. Smoking Tiger sighed. He and Razor belonged to the same ring team, and he had long gotten used to the eccentric man's behavior. He wondered if it was the age difference, he could no longer understand today's youth and their antics. Did you go look at the fight I asked you to? asked Smoking Tiger as he sat before Razor. Razor nodded. And? It ended quickly, said Razor, his eyes still admiring his sword. The fight had indeed ended far too quickly. Smoking Tiger was there as well and wished it had lasted longer to learn more, but it was what they got, and they had to work with what they got. But, Razor looked up, I think he's easy to cut. Smoking Tiger glanced down at Razor's sword. The blade was spotless, not even a speck of dust was allowed to mar the blade's gleam. Razor treated and maintained his sword better than anything in his life, perhaps even better than his own being itself. But all of that ended the moment Razor entered the arena. At that moment, the sword stopped being treated as an ornament and assumed the role for which it was forged, a tool of killing. My dear is thirsty today, I hope she'll be able to quench her thirst today, Razor's toothy smile looked horrid on his angular face. Smoking Tiger shook his head. He turned his head to the locker room's door just a second before there was a knock on it. Smoking Tiger grabbed his sword and stood up. It was time for the fight. 
As they walked to the arena, Smoking Tiger spoke to Razor, I hope you remember the plan. I take care of everything while you stand back, said Razor. Smoking Tiger sighed again. The actual plan was for Razor to be on the frontal offense while Smoking Tiger looked for opportune moments and lapses in concentration to get in critical strikes. It put Smoking Tiger out of the spotlight, but he didn't mind it, he got paid the same, being on the back foot reduced the risk of injuries, and while there were advantages of being in the spotlight, as long as his peers and ring administration knew his value, he had enough bargaining power during contract negotiations. They walked out into the tunnel and entered the caged arena amidst the cheers of the crowd there to see their fight. I can't get used to this, Smoking Tiger sighed as he looked at the crowd. Two V1 crowds were larger than the normal 1v1 fights. He usually only saw half of the people in the crowd, and they weren't as rowdy as they were now. The draw of 2v1 battles was crazier than anything in the ring, even reaching the level of fights in the ninjutsu category. Really? I see no difference, Razor replied in a merry voice as he waved to the crowd. Come on, old man, show the people some love. Let's get them heated up as much as we are. Smoking Tiger wasn't heated, but a little waving wouldn't do any harm. But as he raised his arm to wave, his instincts spiked, and he looked to the other side of the arena a moment before the announcer's voice blared through the microphone. Scars! A man, no, a child, entered the arena. It was their opponent for the day. The fighter wore the mask with a green leaf, but whose name came from the numerous scars that riddled the boy's body. Scaring was nothing new for a shinobi, and especially not for a ring fighter who fought in the weapons category as most people had blades as their weapon of choice, but something was odd about the scarring, a mix of battle scars and what seemed like surgical scarring, it created strange imagery. According to the rumors and gossip floating around the ring, he was less than 15 years old, making him a little older than half of Razor's age and quite younger than Smoking Tiger, who had 10 years over Razor. Smoking Tiger didn't believe that Scars was 15 even though the physique matched the claim. The reason behind it was quite simple. Why would someone as young as a 15-year-old who was allowed to participate and had won 2v1 fights be in the ring in the first place? If someone could be the single fighter battling a duo at such a young age, they wouldn't be dragging themselves in the ring. Someone as talented as that would either be from a clan, who didn't allow their children down in the ring, and if he wasn't from a clan, he would have been scouted by a Chunin or perhaps even be part of a Jonin team, those type of young Jinin lived a different type of life than the Jinin who fought in the ring. They didn't belong in the same world. He believed that Scars simply looked young for his age and was, at the very least, a couple years older than the rumor told him to be, and that was a soft assumption. Smoking Tiger looked at Razor. Due to being on the same team, they knew each other's real identity, and because of that, he knew Razor was part of a Chunin team and was doing quite well for himself. He was a talented young man with some unfortunate quirks that led him to enjoy fighting. If Razor dedicated his time elsewhere, Smoking Tiger believed that he would be able to advance his career. It was truly unfortunate that Razor continued to fight in the ring. As for an old man like himself, Smoking Tiger didn't want to risk injury in every fight. But his missus was pregnant with their fourth child, and raising children was expensive, and raising three with another on the way was more than difficult on a Jinnin's income. He fought so that he could bring in more money to the household, give his children a good upbringing, and secure a retirement for himself and his wife, and his contract was set up in a way that he got more Rio than mission points. Are you ready? asked Smoking Tiger. Absolutely, replied Razor, his voice tinged with a wild hoarseness as he stared at Scars. Smoking Tiger sighed. He wanted to go back home and spend time with his children. But it was time for work. So, this is the ring. Arisu took in the other world that existed under the village. Aha, uh -huh, enjoy it, Kano muttered as she got comfortable in the comfy chairs in the VIP booths that overlooked the arena. Unlike Arisu, she seemed used to it. So much so that she had gone ahead and placed a small bet on the fight they were going to watch. It all started when Arisu couldn't get the ring out of her mind and ended up asking Kano to show it to her. Kano agreed, and they planned to spectate an evening fight after work. 
they had entered through a back alley bar that acted as an entrance to underground passages and caves that house arenas and betting booths used by civilians and shinobi alike to watch fights and gamble on them. Who made these tunnels? asked Terisu. She wondered how long it would have taken to dig out the underground. Kano shrugged. Never bothered to look it up, and it doesn't matter. She glanced at Arisu, you shouldn't be surprised by this. We live in a shinobi village, there are probably a hundred hidden underground structures like this of various sizes littered around the village. Arisu couldn't deny that. She hadn't visited them, but she knew there were a couple of hidden passages on the clan grounds. If her clan had one, probably others had one, ANBU definitely had a few of their own, and so did many of the departments for their own use. So, who are we watching today? Arisu asked Kano. Well, I asked the teller about the most interesting fight today. He told me about the 2v1 fight they're having today, said Kano, looking down as the announcer entered the arena. It seems they don't have many 2v1 fights on the regular, so I thought we might as well watch that. It's between, um, Scars vs. Smoking Tiger and Razor. Huh, weird names. Who did you bet on? asked Arisu. On Scars. Really, why? I don't know. Two versus one doesn't seem that difficult, and the odds were better if I bet on the single guy. Kano looked at Arisu, you should have placed some money. Not for me, said Arisu. Well, your choice, said Kano. Say, why didn't Takuma come? I don't know, actually. He said something about hanging out backstage at the Kabuchi Theater and observing how the actors get ready. He does a lot of strange things, said Arisu. A few weeks back, they were talking, and the topic of the weekend came up. Everyone was talking about what they were doing that weekend, and Takuma said he was going to open a stall at the monthly flea market and see if he could make some profit from goods he had collected last month, something about learning and polishing sales skills. Ah, that's smart, said Kano. Arisu turned to Kano. What do you mean? Transformation Jutsu is good enough for civilians, but any shinobi who's paying attention can tell signs. That's why shinobi specializing in spy work and infiltration learn how to disguise themselves by using physical means like prosthetics and makeup. And who better to start learning from than from the people who help actors with their makeup and costumes, explained Kano. But you can't learn to disguise in one day, can you? asked Arisu. Of course, not. Learning how to do a believable disguise takes time. But him going there and meeting the people creates connections. He gets to know people who he can go back to later when he wants to learn, said Kano. Arisu once again felt Takuma's effort coming through from another place. It was like a race where she could feel someone breathing down her neck while trying to pass her. Oh, look, they're starting up, Kano said, pointing at the arena below. Arisu looked down and saw three people in the arena. Two were standing together while another one was standing on the opposite end of the arena. Now, that's young, Kano commented with a frown. Arisu looked at the fighter standing alone. That must be Scars, she thought. And as Kano pointed out, the Scars fellow was way younger than the other two fighters. He looked closer to her age. Chapter 115 Razor's Insanity the moment the fight began, Razor shot straight towards Scars without the pretense of any planning. He drew the sword out and pointed it at Scars, who armed himself with a kunai in each hand and charged for Razor. Razor grinned behind his mask when he saw Scars taking charge and swung his sword in an aggressive downward strike that Scars took on with his kunai. Sparks flew as metal clashed. Scars pushed the sword away and immediately swiped for Razor's gut, but Razor's footwork moved faster, and he skipped an inch out of range. With the swipe, Scar's body moved in the direction of his swing, committing him to the movement. Razor had already drawn his sword back, ready for the next move, now in a position to strike. Got you, the glee oozing in his voice. Razor thrusted the pointy end toward Scar's shoulder. He wanted to take one arm away so he could have an easier time working on his art on the canvas. He wished to put on a good show and was sure that the audience would appreciate it as well. As Scar's body moved behind his swing, his other arm shot up and forward. The blade met through the leather arm guard, 
and the blade sliced the surface fairly deep but didn't reach the skin, and with the upward arm movement, scars disrupted the trajectory. Razor clicked his tongue. He pulled back his sword in an attempt to slice through the leather and draw some blood from a skin wound, but scars now moved faster. Scars put the weight on his back foot and struck out with his front foot for Razor's knee. The ankle dug into the kneecap and immediately hobbled Razor as his entire balance was kicked into disorder. Scars freed his arm away from the sword and once again swiped for Razor, and this time, it worked. Blood spurted out of a cut across the chest. The wound was shallow due to Razor's last moment desperate dodge. Razor didn't look down at the wound as any moment away from his opponent could lead to his death. He didn't need to look down as the warm blood on his skin and pain over his chest told him all. He didn't appreciate having his body and blood used as a canvas. As Razor tried to push away to get some space, Scars dropped the kunai in his arm and clenched it into a fist. Razor skipped back, but Scars took a swift four step and whipped out a body punch. Razor closed his body and brought his block to stop the punch, but in the split second before the fist made contact with Razor, he was abruptly pulled away from the punch's trajectory. Smoking Tiger pushed Razor away behind him as he faced Scars. This ain't going to be this easy, young buck said Smoking Tiger. Smoking Tiger brandished his sword as he set himself between Scars and Razor. He couldn't let his partner get taken out in the first bout of the fight, that would most definitely spell the end of the fight. In truth, he believed Razor was an equal match to Scars. In fact, their team, too, believed that, which was why they immediately accepted when the scheduling office gave them a choice between Razor and another team member. Smoking Tiger was chosen as the aide to provide Razor with the edge he needed and, well, keep him focused and not let things get crazy. Scars was on an impressive win streak, much more impressive when one considered he had two v one sprinkled among those wins. Smoking Tiger could only imagine the rising win streak bonus he was going home with after every fight. Not only would this win give Smoking Tiger and Razor some notoriety in the ring by taking down a big shot, but it'll also get them the incentives their team promised them. Smoking Tiger knew that he couldn't stop Scars, which was why Razor needed to be in fighting condition. His eyes shifted to Scars' clenched fist that he had saved Razor from. That fist was well known in the ring, as far as Smoking Tiger knew, Scars was the only one to use chakra augmentation in the ring. The uniqueness of it and the damage it could do made it threatening, so much so that many had lodged complaints against Scars and had pushed for banning the chakra augmentations from the Taijutsu and weapons category, but they hadn't gotten anywhere with it. Scars was too big of a draw to restrict now. The people had seen him use chakra augmentation, and if he suddenly stopped using it, they'd be dissatisfied. And he was sure the amount of 2v1 Scars was participating and influenced the management's decision, allowing him to use something everyone else thought should have only been permissible in the ninjutsu category. Smoking Tiger blocked and evaded a spray of shuriken from Scars, but immediately jumped back in when Scars tried to bypass him to get to Razor. He slashed at Scars, who had re-equipped himself with a kunai in both hands like he always did. Smoking Tiger didn't believe he could beat Scars, but that didn't mean he couldn't hold him back. He took charge and pushed Scars back with aggressive swings that Scars effortlessly blocked, but Smoking Tiger was able to push Scars away from Razor, and he was able to create enough time. Smoking Tiger deflected one of Scars' kunai strikes and jumped back as Scars swung the kunai only for Razor to switch in and block the other strike seamlessly. I'm back, baby! Razor yelled with a feverish expression, blood still dribbling from his chest, but he didn't seem bothered at all. He stabbed Scars and nicked him in the shoulder. Scars retaliated with a sudden kunai throw at point-blank range that cracked Razor's laugh, but like a madman, Razor completely ignored it and immediately left a deep gash in the back of Scars' right hand. Smoking Tiger smiled behind his mask, and the moment he saw the gash on Scars' hand, he positioned himself on that side, and the moment he saw an opening, he lunged in with a thrust that ripped through the side of the already injured arm. The arm guard took a chunk of the thrust, but Smoking Tiger was satisfied with it. He stepped back and gave Razor the space, which immediately turned up the aggression to eleven and pressured Scars back while getting a few slashes. That's more like it. Razor yelled. Today will be a great show. 
Scars hobbled back a few steps as Razor landed a solid strike to the calf and almost brought Scars to his knee. Smoking Tiger saw an opportunity and moved in. Scars deserved the reputation he had in the ring as even with his shoddy balance, he parried the next slash from Razor and rolled on his back to evade the downward slash from Smoking Tiger all the while regaining the balance at the end of the backward roll. Razor and Smoking Tiger didn't want him to recollect himself and straightaway charged into pile more pressure on him. And their efforts paid off as Scars froze up in the face of two assailants. Smoking Tiger left a gash in the side with a well-placed thrust while Razor aimed a downward slash for the neck that instead caught the shoulder and dug deep due to the momentum and gravity. We got him, thought Smoking Tiger. But the next moment, faster than he had moved in the fight or the fight they had previously seen, Scar's palm Razor soared up out of his shoulder while launching a terrifyingly quick palm strike into his stomach that launched Razor back like a cannonball. Out of pure instinct, Smoking Tiger followed Razor and instantly realized his mistake, he had looked away from his opponent in the middle of the fight. More importantly, he had looked away from Scars, someone who had just demonstrated that he could use chakra augmentation. Smoking Tiger hastily looked back at Scars, fully expecting to get socked in the face, but Scars suddenly jumped all the way up to the cage surrounding the arena. Chakra augmentation, Kana whistled. Now, that's interesting. She wasn't expecting to see chakra augmentation down in the ring. There were several types of chakra augmentations that affected different attributes, depending on their use case. Many clans held some variant of chakra augmentations that suited their combat style. Chakra augmentations weren't restricted to clan shinobi. There were plenty of augmentations in the Jutsu archives, even though most of them, in Kano's opinion, weren't practically usable, but they were only usually used by Chunin who specialized in combat. She was surprised to see a Jinin in the ring use chakra augmentation, and from the looks of it, he seemed to be decently proficient in it. He could have finished the fight right there, Arisu said, shaking her head. That was a mistake. Kano agreed. The one named Smoking Tiger name had looked away, a grievous mistake, and Scars should have punished Smoking Tiger for it. It would have taken a single Kanai stab in the right place to end the fight for Smoking Tiger. She turned at Razor, who was quaking as he attempted to get up. Both Scars and Razor were injured, and she didn't know if either had shown their complete hand, so she couldn't predict how the fight would go between the two. Scars was the superior fighter because he was going solo, so if she had to, she would go with Scars, especially with the chakra augmentation he had shown. Ring fighters are good at attacking vital points. Given that they were at ring, Kano decided she could give a quick few pointers to Arisu. It wasn't part of her responsibility, but Arisu was from the Fuma clan, Achiha's closest allies, and she liked Arisu well enough to help her out here and there. It's interesting, you know, Kano said after recollecting the points of interest that had already happened in the fight until then. Every clan has developed their combat style after years and decades of adjusting, improving, and optimizing to create something unique to them, suitable to their bloodlines and traits. Older clans like mine and yours with old roots in the warring era had honed their combat through true combat in the turbulent times of chaos, blood, and death. It's that pedigree, rich culture, and tradition that makes us better than others. Uchiha's interceptor style, Fuma's shadow windmill, and others were developed through long years of effort by entire clans that had accumulated into what they were today and were continued to be developed by the current generation and would continue to be developed by the future generations. Kano continued. The ring is doing something similar. A group of shinobi who learn from each other through repeated combat, which, while isn't exactly actual lethal combat, is dangerous enough. Each one of them brings something unique to them, even if that something isn't special, and due to the nature of combat, people learn even if they don't actively intend to. In many ways, it's similar to how clans develop their styles. It's not as effective as the methods that the clans have perfected, and the ring very well doesn't have the pedigree, and it's highly inconsistent due to the competitive and adversarial nature of it all, but they've, without a doubt, have created a style of combat flexible enough that it successfully becomes the foundation, a competent foundation, of so many hidden leaf jinin that go through this. Observe them, Arisu. Many look down at this place, and they aren't completely wrong, 
but you can't deny that there's something that you and even I can learn if we want to. Arisu looked away from Kano and down at the arena. Kano didn't know if Arisu took her words seriously, many in their position wouldn't, but Kano had done her job, now, it was up to Arisu to proceed from here on. Smoking Tiger cautiously but hastily skipped back towards Razor while keeping an eye on Scars, who remained hanging from the cage. Razor, how's your condition? Can you continue? Razor lifted his hard mask above the mouth slit in the ski mask and spat out blood. He clutched his lower chest in agony. I, I can, he coughed. Fight, fight. Did he break a rib? Smoking Tiger bit the inside of his cheek. The place where scars had punched had bruised horribly. It didn't look good. This kind of injury wasn't optimal, but if it was only as bad as it looked, Razor could continue to fight. Plus, they, too, had injured Scar, and if his time hanging on the cage and his lack of attack on Smoking Tiger, it seemed they had done significant damage. There was a sudden burst of cheers from the crowd that made Smoking Tiger look back. Scars had dropped down from the cage and was now standing in the middle of the arena, staring at them. Beside him, Razor stood up and took his sword that Smoking Tiger had retrieved. Smoking Tiger spoke, I have a plan, we should. Shut up, Razor snarled and recklessly charged at full speed towards Scars. Razor! I will kill you! Razor screamed as he drew his sword, bloodlust oozing out of him. Scars threw a trio of kunai at Razor, who effortlessly deflected them with his sword. How dare you make me, yelled Razor. Razor, look out! Smoking Tiger tried to warn. Razor hadn't noticed that right after the kunai, Scars had thrown a surigen, a rope with weights on each end, in their shadow. The rope directed by the weights caught Razor's legs and rapidly wrapped around them, snapping them together and tripping Razor down to the ground. Razor fell. Scars ran toward his fallen opponent. Smoking Tiger ran towards his partner. Alas, he was much slower than Scars. Scar reached Razor first. Razor tried to swing his sword at Scars, who dodged and kicked him in the face. A kunai appeared in Scar's hand, and he immediately used it. Stab! 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 Blood spurted out of Razor's shoulder. He screamed as the same kunai dug into his side. And before he could react, Scar stabbed Razor's thigh and dragged the kunai down to the knee, leaving it there. By the time Smoking Tiger reached them, it was clear that Razor wasn't going to be continuing the fight. Scars looked up, and Smoking Tiger froze when he felt the cold eyes pierce him. He felt a bloodlust blast his body, and it felt like someone was stabbing his body with a hundred kunai. Compared to Razor, who was a maniac for blood, it felt on a completely next level. He got a very real sense that there was a real possibility that things could go terribly wrong and end with his death. He couldn't believe that he had considered Razor and Scars on the same level. Smoking Tigers immediately jumped back and raised his hand in the air, declaring forfeit. His heart leaped in his throat when Scars ran after him with Razor's sword in his hand. Fortunately, Scars stopped the moment Smoking Tiger declared forfeit, and a sharp horn shot blurred through the arena, announcing the end of the fight. Smoking Tiger couldn't calm his heart well past after the fight had ended. Takuma lay with his eyes closed in the medical room while Sango treated his injuries. He had made an egregious mistake. He had frozen during the fight. He might have very well knelt in front of his opponents and given them free swings at him. He had panicked. In that moment when Razor and Smoking Tiger were upon him, the image of two sword-bearing fighters had overlapped with the memory of the two hidden Frost shinobi who had almost killed him in the Land of Frost. Something in his consciousness had made the connection. He clenched his fist. He had defeated the Frost duo, he was alive while they were dead, even if Razor and Smoking Tiger triggered that memory, it shouldn't have elicited that reaction from him. But the truth of the matter was that it did, and that fact unsettled him deeply. It didn't help that one memory dragged more memories out to the surface. It left an undesired taste behind. Hey, ease your arm, Sango said, displeased. Takuma took a deep breath and eased his body, but it didn't help ease what he was feeling. I found what you told me to find out, 
Sango said after she was done patching him up. Takuma opened his eyes and looked at Sango. Perfect. This was exactly what he needed to take things off his mind. Chapter 116, For Shadow Complete The knock on the door made Kano glance up from the paperwork at Takuma standing at her office door. She motioned him to come in as she ticked some boxes and filled over the dotted lines. One day she would die, and she was sure the damn paperwork would be the reason behind it. Is it about the Shirogami robberies? she asked. It was one of the cases Takuma was handling as the second investigator. No, ma'am, Takuma placed an open letter envelope and two sheets of paper on the table. I was going through the anonymous public submissions, and well, I came across this one. I think this one might have some weight behind it. Every police precinct had these submission boxes and post box addresses where civilians could send anonymous tips about crimes in their neighborhood or crimes they had witnessed to the police force to consider without divulging their identity. Kano was skeptical. The anonymous tips were mainly baseless accusations by people who didn't like their neighbors, jealous business owners hindering their rivals, people with grudges who wanted others to get into trouble, building owners who didn't appreciate their tenants but couldn't kick him out because of the lease agreements. It was stupid people trying to get other into trouble, and they wasted time because it wasted a lot of time and manpower to process those submissions and chase the leads which looked real, which would then not pan out. Of course, it had been long since Kano had touched the anonymous submissions. It was grunt work. She had long left the part of her career where she was required to do grunt work. Takuma, on the hand, was precisely in that part of his career. Before him it was Arisu who handled the submissions, but the moment Takuma came in, she dumped the chore to him. You think so? Kano picked up the letter. The two pages were printed by a typewriter, giving no indication as to determine what kind of person wrote it through the handwriting. They could send the letter to the intelligence division to analyze the linguistics, but that would be an overreach for anonymous submission. She read the contents of the letter with disinterest, but by the time she was past the first page, she could see why Takuma thought the submission was legitimate. The detail with which the things were laid out was well thought and written, which made it easy to digest. But the point which made it look legitimate was the subjects mentioned. One of the state pharmacies is illegally supplying to the Myco Triad. The way it was presented made it so that a police force member would read and appreciate the points mentioned in writing, making it convincing. The organizations and groups around the Hidden Leaf were made up and supported by shinobi, active or discharged, and were involved in a number of gray or outright illegal activities hidden behind the veil of legal fronts. They did everything from robberies to collecting payments for security. A lot of them were highly territorial and had well-defined areas where they operated and clashed against their neighbors, which was the source of many homicide cases that came to organized crime due to the intergang conflicts. Shinobi deaths far outnumbered civilian deaths. Myco Triad was another one of the territorial groups that ran labor scams, contract frauds, security extortions, and a variety of other offenses in their territory. They were a big organization in the Hidden Leaf with several Chunin associated with the organizations at its helm, of course, due to the nature of it all, when asked, everyone would refuse their involvement. Looks real, but as usual, nothing of substance we can use, Kano sighed as she dropped the letter on the table. It might have been a better submission than most, but nothing new she hadn't seen before. The police force got hundreds of those submissions, and perhaps a couple of them looked legitimate. It took a hundred potential legitimate tips for them to get one lead that actually turned into something tangible. Should I drop it then? asked Takuma. No, don't do that, said Kano. Even if she didn't appreciate the abysmal return on effort, she couldn't ignore it just because she didn't like it. Forward it to either Yoshiaki or Miwa. Both of them have worked on the Maiko Triad before, they'd be the best to follow up on this. Yes, ma'am. As Takuma exited the room, Arisu walked in with a stack of files in her hand. She opened her mouth to speak, but Kano raised her hand to silence her and silently took the files. Paperwork would kill her someday. Takuma walked out of Kano's office with the letter in hand and gazed across the organized crime's offices. He was satisfied with how the conversation had gone with Kano, he had hoped Kano would take charge, 
but he knew with Myco Tryon involved, she would forward them to those with experience and not needlessly increase her workload. Found something in the tips? Arisu asked behind him. Yeah, just a little something. Hey, who do you think is less busy right now, Yoshiaki or Miwa? asked Takuma. Arisu thought for a second before telling Takuma that Miwa had just closed one of their major cases last week and thus would have more space on their docket if Takuma wanted to present them with the submission to follow up on. On the other hand, Yoshiaki was in a critical stage of two of their cases, regularly making that team pull overtime to ensure everything went right. Thanks, Takuma smiled and headed towards Chunin Uchiha Miwa's cabin before rerouting himself to the other side of the office where Uchiha Yoshiaki's cabin was situated and knocking on the door. Enter. Yoshiaki was a slender man with broad shoulders. Like all Uchiha, he had black hair and onyx eyes with a mix of a few facial features one could find in the Uchiha clan. He was older than Kano and had been part of the police force since the very start, as such was much more experienced when it came to police work, unlike Kano, who had joined the police force after completing her stint under a Jonin team lead. Yoshiaki was an admired figure not only in organized crime but also throughout the police force. Sir, said Takuma. Yoshiaki didn't attempt to hide the sourness that overcame his face when he looked at Takuma. The man looked like his day had been ruined by Takuma breathing the same air as him. No man was perfect. And unfortunately for Takuma, one of Yoshiaki's flaws was his prejudice against civilian-born shinobi. It wasn't to the level where he despised them, but when Takuma was put in organized crime, that had apparently crossed a line in Yoshiaki's mind. He was one of many in organized crime who were against the special recruits training program and their subsequent transfer to major departments. Ever since day one, the man had shown no pretense and had put forth his displeasure for everyone to see. What, said Yoshiaki snipingly. An anonymous submission that seems promising. Takuma tried to put the letter on the table, but Yoshiaki cut him off before he could even take a step forward from the office's threshold. Why are you giving me those? Chunin Kano is your commanding officer. Sir, it might involve the Maiko Triad, replied Takuma. I thought. I don't care what you think, Jinin, Yoshiaki's eyes narrowed. Give it to me. Takuma didn't mind the unfair behavior and handed the letter as he was going to do before being needlessly berated. Saying Yoshiaki reading the letter would be an over-exaggeration, he barely skimmed the pages before dropping them on the table. If he had Sharingan activated, Takuma would have given him credit, but he could see the disinterested onyx gaze cruising over the lines. This is a hoax, Yoshiaki dropped the letter on the table. Maiko Triad won't do this, they have no reason to buy medical provisions. Take this away and get out. Well, they did buy up medical provisions. I was the one who delivered it to them, Takuma thought, but he couldn't argue with Yoshiaki. He picked up the letter and turned to walk out of the office. Yoshiaki had refused him, but he still had Chunin Miwa he could pitch the anonymous letter. Wait, said Yoshiaki. Takuma turned back, a flickering hope in his chest. I changed my mind. Let's pursue that. He smiled, and you know what? We are a little busy right now. How about you try it out? I'm sure you haven't had an investigation where you were the first investigator. This can be your first stint as a lead. How about it? It'll be a good experience. Takuma held back the smile that threatened to break on his face. Yes, sir. Excellent. I'll talk to Kano and have you report to me for this follow-through. We will see this through, said Yoshiaki. Thank you, sir. I won't disappoint you, said Takuma. Yoshiaki smiled. You better not. Takuma walked out of the room and his smile drained, but inside he felt phenomenally great. He wrote the anonymous letter to get a starting point for a potential investigation. He had read enough anonymous submissions to know how to craft one that would gain some traction with the Chunin heads. He typed it out with a typewriter to ensure no one could trace it back to him. All he needed to do then was to present it to Kano, who he knew would see some weight behind it, but due to her lack of involvement with Maiko Triad, he would have to pass it over to one of the teams who did have it. From there, 
Takuma knew that Chunin Miwa and Chunin Yoshiaki were the two options Kano would send him to, those were the two names that came up the most in the police records when he was researching the Maiko Triad. Both were viable options. Uchiha Miwa and her team were strictly professional with Takuma, while Uchiha Yoshiaki's team mirrored their Chunin's opinion. The reason why he had chosen to approach Yoshiaki first was because of that conflicting attitude. Due to Takuma's position as the newest member and the culture of organized crime, if anyone wanted some grunt work done, they could have Takuma do it even though he was part of Kano's team. On multiple occasions, Yoshiaki and his team had dropped troublesome and even senseless work on Takuma, which they were supposed to do, Takuma couldn't complain, and no one saw any fault because that's how things were done in organized crime. The rookie had to earn the chops. All of them had done so at some point in their career. Takuma knew that if he presented something to Yoshiaki, it would surely get rejected. But he also knew that there existed a possibility that Yoshiaki would try to burden him just because he could do it. The letter was written in a way that convinced Kano, but it wasn't enough that Chunin like Yoshiaki and Miwa, who had experience with the Maiko Triad, would see it as a 100% deal. If it was too convincing, they would take the follow-through on their own, which Takuma didn't want. He wanted a case of his own. If he went to Miwa, there was a strong possibility that she would use one of her own to pursue the matter. That possibility only strengthened as they had just offloaded a big case recently, allowing them to take on more work. If Yoshiaki had rejected him, Takuma would have gone to Miwa, showed it to her, and would have tried to get involved in the name of experience. If she, too, had rejected him, he would have volunteered to follow through and say that he had a hunch that this might be something. Unlike Yoshiaki, Miwa could have given him a chance. That was the second option. There existed a chance that Yoshiaki would once again try to push useless work on him as he had done before. Takuma had been in the office long enough to have observed a good number of people and studied them to ensure he didn't say or act in a way to make them suspicious of him. He knew what kind of person Yoshiaki was. He knew that if presented with a chance, Yoshiaki would try to make Takuma's life difficult. And that guess had paid off. Yoshiaki had told him to lead the follow-through, and if it turned out something, he would get the lead as the first investigator. It was time for him to get some traction running in the Leaf Military Police Force. Chapter 117 Events in Motion Kano wasn't happy with Takuma taking work from someone other than her, and it took some convincing and a promise not to let it affect his ongoing and future cases. However, Takuma wasn't worried, he considered time management to be one of his strong points. He did more things on a daily basis than most people to know how to distribute his time to get things done. Getting the anonymous submission accepted by a Chunin was the hardest part, but with that out of the way, Takuma could start with the plan he had plotted. The Maiko Triad was still a dim room for Takuma. What he knew came from the existing reports in the archives, which did give an in-depth look into the organization, but he lacked the ground-level awareness that one would have if one were actively involved in investigating the Maiko Triad. Unlike Yoshiaki and Miwa's teams, he didn't have any contacts with informants and snitches who he could go for up-to-date information, but that didn't mean he didn't have any leads. His point of contact with the Maiko Triad was through Ria's crew. The people involved on the day of delivery were well known to Takuma through his run-in with them when he visited Ria's place to restock his supplies. He knew their names, the company they kept, and what circles they frequented. All he needed to do was tail and observe them until they made contact with someone in the Maiko Triad. Takuma was aiming to build a relationship chain, gather evidence, connect the Maiko Triad to the state pharmacy, and discover the reason behind the medical supply purchase. But his plan wasn't without problems. Takuma was only one man without access to the broader organized crimes departmental resources. He was given the permission and responsibility to follow up on an anonymous lead, it wasn't considered a full case. Until he had something substantial, he was on his own. He couldn't spend all of his time on the job doing stakeouts. Takuma was forced to come up with a solution. Shin! What's up, my man? smiled Takuma as he dapped up the man in an alley near the red light district. He was under the guise of the transformation jutsu as one of the dealer personas he used to interact with his clients. 
H. Hey, Jean, said Shin, looking uncomfortable, his eyes darting around. Takuma smiled. His usual policy was to meet clients at a place considered a middle ground for both parties, somewhere clients would feel safe and comfortable and a location where Takuma could get quickly without wasting too much time. Unfortunately, Shin was no longer a client, and Takuma wanted to set a vibe to keep Shin on his toes. The young man used to be one of his regulars, but it seemed that Shin had run into financial troubles by getting fired from his job. Since then, he could no longer afford luxuries like weed. Takuma cut him clean off and told Shin to only contact him when he had money, which Shin could only do a few times, nowhere close to when he was a regular. So, what do you got for me? asked Takuma. I did what you said and listened to them, Jean said in a hushed voice. They were talking about a delivery and how they're looking into buying more. It all started when Takuma reviewed the information Sango had given him. According to her, the samples he had given to her could have come from a few state pharmacies that were known for producing the type of samples Takuma had given her. While Sango had reduced potential origin by quite a bit, the number of pharmacies she had shortlisted were still a few too many. Takuma had to cut it further. As such, he began looking into Ria's crew, and there it was. Ria's crew was a mix of active and retired shinobi, leaning heavily towards the latter. Takuma discovered that among the few active shinobi, one of them worked in a state pharmacy as a guard. It was a permanent assignment. He didn't even need to think for a second. He knew which pharmacy was supplying the medical supplies to Ryu, who was selling them to the Maiko Triad. Takuma targeted the guard and began following him. He mapped out what a day looked like for the guard and found that he frequented a bar, as did many of Ryu's men. It didn't take long before Takuma saw Ria's men meet with someone who he recognized to be part of the Maiko Triad. He had found their meeting place. Alas, Takuma couldn't do anything from that point onward. The bar was a small establishment, the type that had a few but die-hard regulars who frequented it enough for it to make enough money to stay alive. Takuma could enter one day and go unsuspected, but if he did it during a day when Ria's crew was meeting, he ran the risk of scaring them off, or he might have been denied at the door altogether. That's when fortune favored Takuma in all its glory. The old barman had hired a helper to work with him to serve his customers, and that helper turned out to be Shin. His old client, Shin, whose new job didn't pay enough to buy weed. It was easy from there on. Takuma called up Shin, told him that he wanted some eyes and ears inside the bar, and in return, he would supply the weed. Shin was initially hesitant, but when Takuma gave him a sample of a strain of a quality much higher than Shin had ever experienced, he agreed almost too quickly. Just like that, he had ears on any conversation Ria's crew and Maiko Triad might have in the bar. There was a real chance that they didn't talk about anything of importance in the bar, but they did. Takuma grinned. That's what I'm talking about, Shin. I knew you could do it, he enacted the most frat boy he could. Spill it all, my man. What else did they talk about? A about the thing you promised, Shin looked at Takuma hesitantly. It was Shin's awkwardness that made him seem so harmless, which he was for the most part, but there wasn't a single person who walked the earth who was completely harmless, people only needed the right motivation to do harm. Takuma had provided Shin with the motivation to do harm to people who didn't know they were being harmed. Of course, brother, I have it right here, Takuma took out a plastic bag from his person filled with some of his higher quality products. Shin reached for it, but Takuma pulled it back and placed his palm on his chest. We have known each other for a while now, haven't we? You know how this works, payment always comes first. Shin stared down at the palm on his chest and nodded as he stepped back. The awkwardness came back, and he once again looked nervous, all while his eyes darted to the bag. Now, let's talk at length, said Takuma. Takuma ducked into the police force headquarters to finally escape the pouring rain that had left him soaking wet from head to toe. He groaned to himself, when the rain started to pour, he wanted to go straight home but had documents he needed to file before he could mark his workday as over, thankfully, his pouch was waterproof. He stood in the front reception area to allow the excess water to drip down before he headed inside. Unlike half the precincts around the village, the main headquarters closed down at night. 
Many people headed home, and a lot of them had umbrellas and raincoats ready as they headed out. Should have read the weather report, thought Takuma. He looked at the road outside, watching the raindrops hitting the ground. He liked the rain. Even the most roaring rain slowed the city down, bringing it to a halt, a nice change of pace. Takuma liked the feeling of walking the empty roads while the rain weighed him down. But it was only nice when he could afford to slow down along with the town, something he didn't have often these days. Takuma, if I remember correctly. As Takuma watched the rain absent-mindedly, he heard someone call out to him. He turned back, and all thoughts of rain slowing things down shattered as a high-speed train crashed through as he looked at Uchiha Itachi standing behind him. Ah! Oh. Itachi, Takuma replied. Even though he was taken by surprise, unlike the last time, he was much more composed. He had grown up a little since their first meeting. It's really pouring down today, isn't it? It is, said Itachi. The potholes in front of my place are going to puddle, Takuma sighed. The roads were bad where he lived, fortunately, he could travel by rooftops. But it's good, rain's good. Replenish the underground reserves, good for the atmosphere, good for the plants, and good for us, great for everyone. He turned to the taller person standing beside Itachi. My name's Takuma, he said, extending his hand for a handshake. The man had short, unkempt, dark-colored hair, black eyes and a relatively broad nose, and well-defined eyelashes that were turned upwards at each end, obviously, an Uchiha. Uchiha sure sway, said the man as he shook Takuma's hand. He might have grown, but there were only so many surprises Takuma could take at a time. It took some effort not to let his hand stiffen mid-shake. Oh my, sure sway of the body flicker. I've heard much about you, sir, Takuma didn't forget that he was talking to a jonin. He called Itachi by his name due to how they were introduced, but he couldn't do that with Shursue. I do not deserve that moniker, said Shursue. There are plenty of people who are much better than me at the jutsu. So humble, thought Takuma. Itachi then introduced them to each other. Takuma is from Izumi's batch. He won the Jenin Corp's basic training tournament, his eyes went to Takuma's arm where the police force insignia was stitched, and from the looks of it, he has joined the police force. That I have, said Takuma with a smile. Junior Office Takuma, Department of Organized Crime, at your service. Izumi's batchmate, you say, which means you're the same age as Itachi, and you're already in organized crime? Now that's impressive, Shursue commented. Please, you flatter me, sir. I haven't accomplished anything compared to our friend here, Takuma pointed to Itachi. Shursue shook his head. Everyone has their own journey. Comparing those who are on a different path than yours does more harm than good. Be confident in what you've achieved, Takuma. Being in organized crime when you're not an Uchiha is indeed impressive, Itachi nodded. More impressive when you consider he isn't from an allied clan. An understanding seemed to dawn over Shursue. He asked, so, you are part of the new initiative? If you don't mind, I have some questions regarding your experience here. Takuma was surprised, but he didn't have any reason to refuse, so he agreed. There was no reason for either party to harm the other, and Takuma guessed it would be good to make a connection, no matter how slight it was. It was a pity though, Takuma thought. It was a first impression, but he liked Shursue enough. It was a true pity that he was going to die so soon. Chapter 118, Sus Takumo Shin's eavesdropping was a substantial breakthrough for Takuma. Through the conversation Shin had picked up, he was able to gather the date of the next delivery. Unfortunately, those conversations didn't include the location of pick-up and drop-off. From what Shin had told Takuma, the people seemed to have a predetermined location which didn't warrant stating the exact address during conversations. Having done the delivery once, Takuma knew of the locations, but those could very well be a set of locations, with the different choices available for safety purposes. Even if he was to assume there was only one set of locations, that information was unusable, for he couldn't justify them, and even before that, assuming something like that was unwise when he had no previous experience with planning such operations. 
Given the circumstances, Takuma had to pivot his strategy. What are you doing? Arisu asked Takuma, who was going through a tower of folders on his desk. Looking into records of theft at state facilities, Takuma muttered as he went through the past several months of records to see if there were reports of missing inventory at state pharmacies. Arisu frowned, this is about the follow-up you were doing, you're still doing that? Aha, uh -huh, still doing that, Takuma's voice trailed down before he sighed. There was nothing of suspicion that he could be linked back to either Ria's crew or Maiko Triad. In his opinion, the sheer amount of product he had delivered wasn't something one could swipe away without it being reported. And if they were doing multiple deliveries, then there was no way anyone could hide it even if every member in the pharmacy were corrupt and under someone's payroll. There had to be at least a report of it somewhere, but the fact there wasn't meant they were doing something different. You're wasting your time, said Arisu. If the tip hasn't given you anything yet, it's bogus, drop it already. I don't have much time on hand, definitely not enough to waste, he muttered. Do you really think this is going to turn into something? Takuma swiveled his chair to face Arisu. Think about it this way. If it does turn into something big, I'd be on the record of a big case, putting me up two to zero on you. Two to zero? Arisu frowned. When did it go up one to zero? The Higarashi pharmaceutical case, he grinned. It was the first Sirank mission he was ever assigned, it was his first mission with Irika. And that was before I even joined the police force. He wriggled his brows at her. Oh, fuck off, she spat. You got that job because we were short-handed. What your team did, I could have done alone. And they didn't let you do it. What does that tell you? Fuck you, Arisa kicked his chair, almost making him fall, before walking away. Takuma laughed before turning back to the tower of folders. The sight of it made him sigh. A dead end. He needed more groundwork before he could move to the next step of the process, understand the entire operation and get an insight into how they pulled the con. He stood up to gather the folders so that he could return them to the archives, but as he gathered the folders, a thought struck him from the banter he had with Arisu. The Higarashi Pharmaceutical Case The mission that he worked with Irika was part of a larger mission run by the police force. A group of thieves were stealing the raw materials meant for the privately owned pharmaceutical business. They would hijack the shipments mid-delivery and then fence them off to people who couldn't buy the materials in bulk due to regulations. Takuma stared at the files as thoughts began to form in his mind. They aren't stealing from the state pharmacies, they're using it as the kitchen, he muttered. Takuma immediately picked up the files and ran to the archives. Previously he had thought they were stealing from the product produced by the state pharmacies, that the guard was stealing from the inventory, and Ryu was selling it to the Maiko Triad. But with the lack of police reports as back as Takuma had looked and the new thought in his mind, he had a different thought. Takuma rushed into the archives and began looking into any and all reports for robberies of raw medical grade chemicals and other raw materials from producers that worked in the hidden leaf. And as he expected, within half an hour, he had found multiple reports all filed within the one year, each from a different part of the village, all from different businesses. Some cases were solved, some were ongoing, while others had gone cold due to a lack of leads. He took out his notepad and flipped to the page with the information Sango had given him about the ingredients used in the samples he had shared with her. Knew it, he flicked the notepad. He found a third of the ingredients used in the samples among the products reported as stolen. All of them were restricted materials that needed proper permits to make, sell, buy, and use. There's an Arionine cooking for Ryu, thought Takuma. He had thought that guard was the sole party in the pharmacy, but it seemed he was only a contact, and Ryu was in contact with an Irionine who was cooking for them using the materials they stole. All right, Takuma smiled, let's see what we can do with this. Takuma stood outside Yoshiaki's office with a file in hand that he needed signatures on. He knew very well that behind the closed door was Yoshiaki and his entire team engaged in some heated discussion about one of their cases which had apparently gone wrong. Yoshiaki had been given a talk down by Yoshio, and he was now giving it to his team. Takuma knocked on the office door and opened it without waiting for a response. 
All eyes inside the room went to Takuma as he half-stepped inside. He started, sir. Out! Yoshiaki immediately yelled. Get out! Takuma did not attempt to try again or argue and immediately closed the door behind him. Naturally, he knew it was a bad time to approach Yoshiaki for a signature, and it was especially worse for him because the man hated him. It was clear before Takuma stepped inside the office that he was getting rejected. And that's precisely what Takuma wanted. This way, Yoshiaki wouldn't be able to complain later by saying he wasn't asked first. He ignored the eyes of people who had caught the scene and walked straight to Kana's office, knocked on the door, and waited on the threshold of the open office until she looked up and told him to step inside. Ma'am, Chunin Yoshiaki is busy with his team, Takuma presented the papers to her. Can you sign these for me? I don't think it's wise for me to disturb him right now with what he's got on his plate. Oh yeah, he got thrashed by Yoshio, didn't he? Kano chuckled as she read the papers. Hmm. You need an assignment of more people for a case. Which case, wait, is this regarding the tip you were following? She looked up at him, that reached this far? Takuma nodded. We think there might be something there worth looking for. He stressed the we to make it seem that Yoshiaki agreed with him, even if Takuma had given the man close to no updates about the situation. Takuma was sure that Yoshiaki didn't even remember that Takuma was working on something. Look at that didn't expect it. All right, here you go, Kano signed the papers. Good job on sticking to it, Takuma. Thank you, ma'am, Takuma smiled. The shinobi recruited into the police force were categorized into two categories, regular and special. They entered at the same time but were given different trainings and were assigned to different departments with varying levels of responsibilities. Because of that, even though all of them were jinin, Technically speaking, Takuma was at a higher rank than them. He couldn't randomly order one of the new recruits to do a job for him, but he could very easily get the permission to assign them under him temporarily, which was what he did by getting Kano to sign the order. Inside one of the precincts across the hidden leaf, Takuma stood in front of a group of four shinobi. Beside him was a whiteboard with four photographs and some textual information to go along with them. These are the men possibly related to a string of robberies which we suspect are related to each other, performed by the same group of people, said Takuma. We are looking to build a case against them and learn more about their operation. For that to happen, we need information. Unfortunately, we don't have much of that, which is why you're enlisted to bridge that gap. Takuma was only one man and dearly wished he possessed the shadow clone Jutsu. But he knew it wasn't his stars. He understood that he couldn't keep all cards close to his chest and still expect to win. There wasn't enough time for him to do all the things on his own, and he couldn't be at eight different places at the same time. The only option for him was delegation. His heart was conflicted, begging him not to do it. Relenting control felt terrible. But his mind was clear that if he didn't push some responsibility off him, the entire tower would go down with only him inside. He needed help. Each of you will be assigned a target who you will stalk as if they were the most beautiful girl in the world, said Takuma, eliciting a few chuckles. Find all you can find about them, what they do every week of the day, where they go, who they talk to. Watch them, but do not make contact with them. We are looking for a bigger score, let's not waste it away on some petty change. If they do something that warrants an arrest, dock it down, and we will use it later. It was quick quicker than Takuma has expected. Too quick. The officers returned with some really good info on the people they were tasked to follow. Perhaps Rhea's crew and Maiko Triad had gotten complacent after pulling jobs without a hint of resistance. It wasn't strange. That's how people got caught, they got careless. Or, actually using a team of shinobi who knew what they were doing made tasks so much easier. He could see why people hired shinobi. It turned out Maiko Triad and Ria's crew were using the same gambit as they did with Takuma and outsourced the delivery process. Just this time, unlike Takuma, the delivery person was a gambling addict in desperate need of money who was nowhere as careful as Takuma and babbled about the plan to a lone shark who cornered him to get some additional time on repayment. 
One of the officers who was tailing the guy caught the entire conversation as clear as a crystal. I guess, this is it, Takuma hammered down his excitement. It wasn't time to get excited, everything depended on what came next. He pushed his chair, and the wheels beneath it carried him to Arisu's desk, who was reading a woman's magazine. Hey! Arisu jumped and immediately hid the magazine. She turned and fixed him with a glare, clearly displeased. Takuma ignored that and posed the question he knew would interest her. How would you like to be the secondary lead on a potentially massive case? He needed some manpower, and Arisu was going to be the gateway to it. Chapter 119 Bad Boys, Bad Boys, What You Gonna Do? Takuma was well aware of his position in the police force. Being an outside hire, he lacked the pedigree that most police force members had in one way or another. He was neither from a clan that had members in the police force nor did he have immediate relatives paving the way for him. In a very tight-knit organization, which was the Leaf Military Police Force, he didn't have many threads connecting to him or others who he could call connections, but he did have some connections. His partner, Fuma Arisu, was one of his few connections. Even though they were of the same rank, they didn't hold the same power. Unlike him, she had the pedigree of the Fuma clan and immediate relatives like her father and aunt working in the police force. I'm planning a raid for which I need some personnel, Takuma said to Arisu. They sat in a corner booth of a busy restaurant that Takuma had booked for this conversation. He knew the owner from when he had worked here as a delivery boy and then had continued to buy lunch boxes when he was too busy to cook his own food because he liked the staff meals that the owner provided for the employees. I do not understand why we are having this conversation, Arisu asked, suspicious. If you want a team for the raid, ask Kano for authorization, she'll give you everything you want. Coming to me makes no sense. I'm working under Yoshiaki for this one, and you know it as well as I do, that he ain't giving me the authorization for a raid, said Takuma. He could bypass Yoshiaki and commission a few ground-level officers by going to Kano, but a raid would reach Yoshiaki's ear no matter what. Even if Yoshiaki goes forward with a raid, he will throw me on the roadside. And? Takuma narrowed his eyes. Don't pretend you don't know what I mean. I won't be on the case report, much less getting any credit for the work I've put in. Yeah, so I hope you understand why I'm not so excited about that future. In his position, if he let go of his control over the situation, he was never getting it back. What do you want from me? She asked. Some of your friends who would be interested in joining a very important op. Perhaps throw in a couple of Uchiha in there, and I guarantee that this would be a grand success for everyone involved. Arisu had the pull Takuma lacked. She could call people, and there was a strong possibility they would agree and show up. The best option was an Uchiha taking charge of the recruitment, but Takuma didn't have someone like that, Arisu was his best and only choice. You do understand we will get in trouble if we mounted a raid against explicit permission, said Arisu. Any mistake from a mishap during the raid to what comes after we get them will be used against us, it will be used against me and especially you. Of course, Takuma knew that, so he had done his homework. He took out the file he had built consisting of everything important regarding the case, he left out some parts, such as Shin's identity as his informant, things he couldn't explain, which would get him in trouble. He slid it across the table to Arisu. She shot him a look before reading what he had compiled. For things to go how he wanted, Takuma needed to deliver something people couldn't push aside and ignore. A result so substantial that even if he broke protocol, the result was meritorious enough for the higher-ups to sweep it under the rug. It was a risk, but a risk Takuma was willing to take. Arisu muttered, this. We are looking at a dozen or so arrests in the raid itself. One of them is sure to open their mouth and tell us more, imagine the people we could connect this with. The police force could potentially get their hand on people they couldn't before, Takuma leaned forward. There was a reason why he had assigned men on Maiko Triad members and not just Ryu's crew to find out the delivery details. He wanted a strong case that could implicate more and more people because that's what made this whole ordeal tempting. It was the future prospects that could be built on top of his ground-level case. 
Takuma wanted to give police force an excuse to get people into the interrogation rooms and have people implicate others in return for lenient sentences for the charges, which would be stamped on them if the raid was successful. To cast a net as wide as possible and see what the hall bought in. Takuma could see interest in Arisu. She wasn't an idiot, and even if she couldn't see as far as he was, she could tell that even in the moment, this was something that could turn big if successful. He said, and how would you like your name to be the next one after me? The secondary lead. All you have to do is to gather some people who would be interested, and that can be yours. Takuma didn't want to split credit, but he wasn't in the position to not do so, and as long as he was cemented as the top contributor, the one in charge, no one could deny him rewards. Accept it, Arisu, he spoke again. You know it as well as I do, you aren't going to get anything like it for this cheap. Every case where either of them was involved had Kano as the primary lead, with members of Kano's team as secondary leads. That position was often shared by two or more people depending on the case. He was offering her a case without any direct shooting involvement, where she would have a much bigger slice of the pie, and all she had to do for it was to convince some people to be the muscle. Takuma backed off and gave her some space. Persistence had its place, but it was not here. He wasn't asking her for a favor, he was actively offering her a valuable opportunity, it was an act of give and take. He had presented his pitch, it was up to her if she wanted to buy into it. How many do you need? she asked. Takuma smiled. Arisa stared at the group gathered in the off-site location maintained by the police force, the people she had gathered for Takuma. They were armed to the teeth, ready for anything thrown their way. She couldn't say she wasn't nervous and doubting her decision to accept Takuma's proposition. They ran the risk of offending the higher-ups by going behind their backs to run a multi-stage operation which could go wrong in so many ways. Of course, Takuma had thought about those things. Arisu found how serious Takuma was when he explained the plan to her and gave a criterion of the type of people he wanted her to focus on during the recruitment. In his words, he wanted sheeple. Takuma wasn't looking for big names, instead, he wanted people who were overlooked for others, the ones who, because of that, would jump at the chance of being part of something big. He wanted people who could follow orders competently without much fuss. Most importantly, he wanted people who wouldn't turn into bigoted morons when they saw an outsider like Takuma leading the operation. That restricted her search pool quite a bit, but she managed to gather a team she thought was suitable for the job. As one would expect, the majority was held by Fuma clan members. Not only were they the easiest to convince, but she also wanted the Fuma to have the biggest slice. Of course, she had gotten a few Uchiha as Takuma had insisted any amount of Uchiha would give them some validity, no matter how little it was. It was tough to shortlist Uchiha, who weren't turned off when they heard Takuma was leading the operation. Rest were from minor allied clans who worked in the police force. Arisa glanced back when she heard the door creak open and saw Takuma enter. She could see the heavier chainmail he wore inside from his fuller silhouette and protective pairing on his arms and legs. He was expecting and ready for combat. Ready? he asked. Arisu nodded. She wasn't going to let her nervousness show. It was go time, and she couldn't let anyone doubt her. Good. Let's start the final debrief. Takuma clapped his hands to gather attention. The conversations came to a halt as everyone looked at Takuma, who asked them to gather around. I hope everyone's familiar with their assignments by now. It's important that both teams do their task perfectly for this to be a success, said Takuma to the people after he went with the plan for the last time. The targets we are pursuing today are shinobi, so I request and expect everyone to display their best not because I think we aren't capable enough, but because I don't want any of us to die. It goes without saying, but protect yourself and your team. It's not worth putting in this work and not live to see the result. And, well, I'll be kicked off the force, and my career as a shinobi will go to the shitter if any of you die. So, if not for yourself, try to live for me. That bought some chuckles from the people. Takuma smiled. If we do this today, we will not only prevent illegal material from reaching hands where it doesn't belong. We will also be taking it off the future market. 
This op will affect multiple cases which have hit dead ends and run cold by breathing a new life into them and avenues for multiple new ones to open up. We are doing good, and all of it will be because of you good people gathered here. I should be thanking you, but I won't. He gave them a look over, let's postpone that to the after party when all of this is over, shall we? Courtesy of our lovely friend, Fuma Arisu. Give her a cheer. Arisu sighed when cheers went up from the group. Yeah, yeah, sure, you cheap steaks, Arisu said. You heard her, folks, Takuma said. Let's earn ourselves a party. Arisu lay on her stomach atop the roof of a building, gazing at the warehouse across the street. It was Site 1, the origin of the delivery. According to the intel gathered by Takuma, the delivery man would collect the load from the suppliers. Their objective was to take all the people inside the warehouse into custody. It was essential that everyone was arrested, as such, Takuma had given Arisu the lead on it. He believed they were the crew stealing restricted materials, and their arrest would provide a break for the cold cases. She was given the team of her choice to make it happen. The mule is out, whispered one of her teammates. A man sneaked out of the warehouse with a large courier-sized duffel bag on his back. Everything about him screamed jittery and nervous. His eyes darted everywhere as he ran with skittish steps. Go, she said. As planned, one broke away from the team to tail the delivery man just in case. Final check, she said and checked her gear. Her cousin, who she had recruited, said, Should we move in? No, two more minutes, she said. Takuma had put down a wait time before they could breach as a precautionary measure in case the suppliers wanted to give Maiko Triad a heads up that the delivery was en route. Sign is go, Marissa sat up. Secure the exits. They had procured the building plans, and Takuma had done a recon of the facility to get them a solid picture, upon which they had built a breaching strategy. Arisu tilted her head closer to the mic and spoke, move in. Arisu and her cousin entered from the front. She released two Fuma shuriken from their binding and assembled it within the next two seconds. It was two sizes smaller than her primary weapon, but she couldn't use her favorite baby here, she couldn't afford her targets dying or having parts of their body sliced off. Cover, she whispered to her cousin, no more words were exchanged between the two Fuma clan members. It didn't take long for them to make contact. Two of the four men had their backs to her. The moment they made eye contact, she issued the warning. Leave military police force. All of you are under arrest. Surrender now. Of course, she wasn't expecting them to do anything like that. Her voice made them snap into action. The first man who saw her ran away from the back exit. Stupid move, Arisu clicked her tongue. She winded her arm and threw one of her shurikens for the runner. It sliced forward like a laser, passing between two men who immediately backed away in surprise and fear. Eh yeah. The shuriken's large sharp metallic edge found its target in the runner's back. He was thrown to the ground, his momentum dragging him forward as he fell. In the time that happened, the other men drew their weapons, and Arisu was under attack with a spread of kunai and shuriken, but before they could hit, her cousin stepped forward with hands forming seal. Her lung puffed up with air that she spat out in a powerful gust that blasted away all the projectiles. Arisu took no measure to protect herself, knowing that her cousin would take care of it and threw her other shuriken. This one traveled close to the ground, and the target tried to dodge it with a vertical jump. Unfortunately for him, in the last second, the shuriken took a sharp upward turn and embedded itself into his thigh. The second screen changed the game. Arisu released the invisible chopper thread and equipped herself with two kunai as she walked forward toward the remaining two. One of them was smart enough to drop to his knees and raise his hands in the air. The other one wasn't so smart and ran for the back. Arisu didn't give chase and kept her attention to the three men. She couldn't go complacent until they were stripped of their weapons and properly restrained. Behind Arisu, her cousin spoke. One is coming your way. Not five seconds later, they saw the bright glow and wisps of fire from a fire-release ninjutsu from one of the dirty grilled windows. Target has been placated, came a crackling sound through their comms. Excellent work, team, 
spoke Arisu. Let's wrap this up. Chapter 120, Big Brain Takuma Takuma and his team waited at the drop-off point in silence. They had been lying in wait for two hours, patiently waiting for the delivery to arrive. Arriving early allowed them to hide without sounding any warning bells. Though he couldn't deny that doing nothing for two hours was tiring, he felt like going to sleep. But then his comms came to life. The delivery has arrived. The entire team's comms ran on the same frequency. Takuma had instructed one man to follow the delivery man so they could be informed and start getting themselves ready after a long period of time. Wake up, people, said Takuma. He stepped half out of the shadow and peered at the building designated as the drop-off point. It was a different location from where Takuma had dropped off his load, but just like his one, it was also on the edge of Maiko Triad territory. The delivery man stopped in the middle of the street in front of the building and looked around like an idiot for a few seconds before heading inside. In the two hours they had been perched around the building, they had detected the presence of two men who had arrived half an hour before. They were hiding over the building. It was clear that they were the men from Myco Triad there to collect. It took five minutes for the delivery man to exit the building and bolt in the direction away from the Myco Triad facility as fast as possible. Follow him, Takuma said into his calm. Roger. Roger. And as planned, two men, one from Arisu's team, who had been following the delivery man, and another one from Takuma's team went after the delivery man. Their orders were to follow the man to a distance before arresting him. Sending one man might have been enough, but Takuma didn't want to take the risk. They have moved, came from the comms. Hold, Takuma replied, we will follow when they move out. Are we sure we don't want to catch them right here? Takuma looked at his comms with a frown. No, we're following the plan. No deviations. The plan was to follow the two men to their final destination and arrest everyone they found there. With the work he had put in, Takuma wasn't satisfied with getting two goons. There was a reason why he had brought five other people along with him, six if you considered the one man he had sent after the delivery man, and it was hell for sure wasn't for two people. The two Myco Triad members left the building, and one had a large duffel bag on their back. Takuma gave the order, and the entire team followed them at a distance. Most of them kept to rooftops while their targets stayed on the streets. Why? Why aren't they being more cautious, said one of Takuma's teammates. The two men were strolling through the streets without a hint of worry. They were jogging at best and showed no signs that they had an entire big bag of illegal goods. Takuma replied, it's the Myco Triad territory, and they haven't been caught before. They have no reason to be cautious. And looking unbothered is the best way to deflect unwanted attention. Plus, the bag they used was the standard one most delivery men used. Their nonchalant attitude represented what Myco Triad represented in this part of the town. They had no fear, and Takuma had spent multiple weeks witnessing that as he did some study of the Myco Triad. Takuma told his team to ignore the carefree attitude and keep vigilance. Eventually, they reached their final destination, which seemed to be a dry cleaner shop. This is it, said Takuma before addressing one of his teammates. Minoru, if you will. Minoru was a well-sought-after sensory-type shinobi who could sense chakra signatures emanating from shinobi. Anyone could feel the presence of chakra when it was especially powerful or released in large enough quantities. However, only sensory-type shinobi had the ability to sense chakra at their own discretion, allowing them to detect it in non-combat situations, as well as tell individuals apart by their unique chakra signatures. How did Arisa get someone like Minoru on the team? As it turned out, Minoru was socially awkward, someone who struggled with networking and communication, which put him back in comparison to his more well-spoken and socially competent peers, even though he had a gift not everyone had. Takuma was elated when Arisu bought Minoru for him. He felt he had gotten a scout as good as a Hyuga, well, not really, but Takuma was more than satisfied with what he got. Ten people inside, Minoru responded after half a minute. Two of them are civilians. 
A sensory type shinobi could read the chakra signature to determine if someone was a shinobi or civilian from the amount held inside their body. And because of that, they could even. Is there a chunin inside? Takuma asked and waited with bated breath to receive an answer. A lot depended on the reply. The Maiko triad had chunin in their ranks, but they were the topmost leaders. Takuma didn't believe one would be present, but anything could happen. No, answered Minoru. Minoru's short answer relieved Takuma more than Sango's healing on a searing wound. All right, it's time to breach, people, said Takuma. The enemy outnumbers us by two people, and two civilians are in their midst. We need to be careful about how we handle them. Minoru, where are the civilians? In the front. Shinobi in the back. That made their work much more manageable. Minoru and Shinju with me, we enter from the back. Rest approach from the front, secure the civilians before engaging, Takuma issued a command. The dry cleaner shop wasn't big enough to mount a stealth attack, and the density of people in that space made it so they couldn't pick off people one at a time, but that didn't mean they couldn't employ a little bit of stealth to get themselves an advantage. The back doors of the building were the standard heavy-duty industrial double doors. Alas, the sturdiness of the door panels didn't mean anything if a poor lock as a weak link turned everything useless. Takuma knelt beside the door and worked on the lock as silently as possible to not alert anyone inside. Click! The door was pushed open slowly, and the trio of Takuma, Minoru, and Shinju entered the building. The back hallway was lined with boxes and other things that hadn't seen use from the coating of dust on them. Minoru signaled to the left door down the hallway. Takuma himself picked up low chatter noise from the same direction. With silent steps, they shuffled to the door. Takuma took out a kunai with a tag on its tail before looking at the other two. They nodded, and Shinju whispered into her comms, Go in three. Takuma quickly stepped in front of the door and took a mental snapshot of the room. For people around a table with a large duffel bag sitting on it. No windows that could be used as an escape route. There was another open door in the room, and by deduction, the other four targets could be in that room. As Takuma processed that, he threw up his kunai into the room. Hey! he yelled, and everyone looked at him, and, in turn, caught the kunai in their field of vision. Takuma stepped away from the door and closed his eyes a split moment before the flash tag on the kunai went off. Not wasting a millisecond, Takuma began weaving hand seals. Minoru was next to step to the door and threw a regular explosive tag at a height above the four Myko triad men who were temporarily blinded by the sharp flash. Bang! The explosive blast threw the blinded men off their feet, further disrupting their balance. Minoru stepped away, and Takuma switched in. He weaved the last hand seal and felt the chakra gather in his chest and throat. He took a deep breath before spewing water from his mouth in a waterfall-like manner, focusing it on the two men closest to him, swamping them with the force of a rampaging river. He moved his head to the side, and the other two got the same treatment, slamming them into the wall. Water release, wild water wave. His newest Sirank Jutsu, among others, that he had acquired in preparation for Ring's ninjutsu category. He held the water barrage and pressure for a few more seconds before stepping inside. Behind him, Shinju finished her hand seals. The water that had pooled and flowed out of the room rippled, and four thick tentacles rose from the water and whipped the four prone men before wrapping around them like slithering snakes restricting their prey. Leave military police force. Surrender at once. Stay down, or it'll only hurt more. Takuma shouted. He should have done that before he blasted them with water, but it didn't matter. They had illegal military-grade medical drugs that was more than enough cause for Takuma to get rough with Shinobi. The duffel bag was in surprisingly good condition after the explosion tag though many things had spilled out due to the surprise attack they had mounted. Takuma picked up the bag and threw it to Minoru outside the room to secure it. From ahead in the building, the noise of struggle could be heard. Takuma headed towards the front to provide the other team back up. However, he wasn't worried as the general combat capability of a police force member was substantially higher than their peers, plus, 
the other team had an Uchiha with them, though that Uchiha had yet to activate his Sharingan. Suddenly, one of the men who Takuma and his team had followed appeared out of the corner and landed a solid punch on Takuma's face. Takuma was forced one step back. He looked back at the man and whipped a punch of his own with chakra flowing out on impact. The man doubled over as Takuma's fist bit into his stomach, making the man spit out fluids. Infants punch harder than that, Takuma said as he kicked the man square in the face, knocking him cold out. Takuma weaved hand seals and lightning arcs of lightning release, shock snaked around his arm as he entered the room. He raised his arm to shoot the first Maiko triad person he saw, only to find that the second team had taken care of the mess. One of them ran out, one of them said, We have to find him. It's okay, we took care of him and the others, Takuma smiled as he put his hand down and dissipated his chakra. We did it, everyone, he smiled and felt a huge weight lift off his shoulders. It took a long time to plan for this operation. In his seemingly already full life, he had to find more time to collect information, manage an informant, tail people, and carefully work around office politics, all the while treading a fine line of a possibility that it was all for nothing. It was his first time leading a team, not to mention a team with more than ten people, even now, he felt it wasn't real. But now, all of it was over. We fucking did it! Takuma might have been overly emotional when he thought it was all over. In fact, arguably the most difficult part of the ordeal was yet to come. You better keep that sewer rat of yours in check, Kano. I want to see him suffer. Kano slammed the door to her office behind her and sat down at her desk, all the while staring at Takuma sitting in front of her desk. It was already late at night, but because Takuma and his team had arrested so many people, it had attracted attention, which had brought Chunin like Kano and Yoshiaki to the office. You know, there's showing initiative, and then there's going above not one but two Chunin's heads to mount a high-risk operation with so many moving parts, said Kano. It was scary, thought Takuma as they sat there under Kano's gaze. He knew the look she had, it was the one that she usually had when interrogating suspects. But the scary part of it was that she wasn't even trying to hide her activated Sharingan behind her red glasses. Takuma could clearly see the pair of red Sharingan trained on him. They judged his every twitch and movement. He couldn't describe the feeling, but he could now firsthand understand why Sharingan was as feared as it was, and it wasn't even a combat situation. I understand why you wouldn't want to work with Chunin Yoshiaki, given his words and actions towards you, I can empathize with why you would sideline him, but me, Takuma, she asked. Have I mistreated you in any way? Have I not done enough to make you feel included? I might not have been chummy with you, but I believe treating you the same as anyone under my charge without any bias was the most respect I could give to someone in your position. Was that not enough? No, ma'am. You aren't at fault. Of course, I'm not at fault. That was never in doubt, Jin and Takuma. It was you and your group who launched an unauthorized operation today in a territory that has always been a sensitive area in the village. You have no idea how wrong this could have gone for you and for all those you had involved in it, said Kano. Did you perhaps think that if you had come to us, we would have shut this down? That we would have not accepted it even if you had shown us sufficient proof? Do you think so little about me? No, ma'am, that's not. Takuma pursed his lips. He couldn't deny any of the questions Kano had thrown to him. He knew why he had done it. For credit. But he couldn't say that to Kano. Kano heaved a deep sigh. Takuma knew nothing he could say would solve this situation, but he had already accounted for this situation. He took out a case file he had kept at his desk and placed it in front of Kano. What is this? she asked. It was everything he had on the case, and it was formatted as such that it was a true case file, he had checked and rechecked the file three to four times before he was satisfied. In fact, all it needed was a signature for it to become an official case file. He knew what was at stake, Arisu and others knew what was at stake, but everyone else had no idea how long of a net Takuma had cast. Ma'am, I know what we did was wrong. We broke protocol that's set in place for logical reasons. I admit I should have come to you. 
but I assure you that our actions were towards a just cause. Takuma started when Kano was already a few pages into the report and was beginning to understand what Takuma's vision. It had convinced Arisu, and she had used it to persuade others as well, two of whom were Uchiha. It was proven what he had accomplished was valuable. However, he hadn't revealed everything to Arisu, he had withheld one fact from her. His ace. Ma'am, Takuma called. Kano looked up at Takuma, and while the Sharingan remained the same, he could tell the mind behind those eyes wasn't focused on him. Today, we might have stopped a gang war from happening, which would have caused a lot of shinobi deaths. That's the end of this tale for now. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you on part 7.